to order the September 25th meeting of Boulder's Housing Advisory Board, and we'll start with a roll call. Let's start all the way down with our ex officio. Brian Bowen, Planning Board. Mason Moyer. Terry Pomos. Juliet Boone. Adam Swedlick. Jacques Riel. Judy Nod. Dan Teodoro. Okay, uh, let's go to agenda review. Any changes, revisions anyone has to the agenda? All right, got it in one, awesome. <laughs> um, approval of minutes, so we have two sets of minutes to approve. Um, let's just quick talk about the July 24th ones again. So you might remember we had some things come up with our representations to staff, Alpine Balsam, that um, Judy suggested that we put some revisions to the, those recommend, or those uh, suggestions uh, within the minutes for July 24th. So um, currently the board sort of decided that that was okay going into it, but we need an official approval of those minutes. Um, so I guess I'm just gonna make a motion to approve the minutes as amended um, with Judy's suggestions. And Jay? May I make one additional suggestion? Yes. Um, just to be clear that it's a summary prepared by Judy. If it's it's, it's not by the board. entire board, correct. Right. But every, what? Yeah, no, I mean, it would still be approved by the full board. Right, and everyone had an opportunity mm -hmm. to weigh in on it? Yep. Okay. Can I get a second to that motion? Second. Discussion? Okay, all those in favor of approving the July 24th minutes as amended? And we're gonna try to not make a regular habit out of this, um, but that is a unanimous approval. <clears throat> I don't, <laughs> and I don't, in fact. Um, okay, moving on, August 28th minutes, uh, anyone wanna? Anyone else want to make a motion to approve those? Make a motion. I'll move we approve the minutes for August 28th. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous. Okay, let's go to the fun part. Public participation, we only have uh, one person signed up right now, uh, Leah Travis, and you have three minutes. Good afternoon. My name is Leah Travis. I live at 4705 Koala Drive here in Boulder, and I'm currently a law student at CU. I work as a student attorney in the Sustainable Community Development Clinic at the school, whose mission is to engage in economic development projects both on behalf of clients and on behalf of the public, public interest with the goal of increasing social justice and social enterprise in a range of substantive areas, including land use, housing, local food, and healthy communities. For the past several years, the clinic has worked with Boulder area mobile home residents in a number of different ways. Over the last school year, the clinic was involved in the passage of the Mobile Home Park Act here in Colorado. While I was not a student attorney in the clinic at that time, I am now, and we are currently watching the rulemaking process for the dispute resolution portion of the act. The act recognized the harms occurring in mobile home parks stemming primarily from the lack of enforcement of existing laws and exploitation from mobile home park own owners. Initially, I have several concerns with the act that I believe need to be clarified during the rulemaking process. While cities like Boulder cannot step in and create their own ordinances regarding the dispute resolution process, the city of Boulder can make its voice heard and contribute to rulemaking. Primarily, Boulder can indicate that many of its ordinances currently in place, such as those regulating mobile home park streets and walkways, mobile home park environmental standards, utilities, and other public improvements, can be more effective if residents of mobile home parks are able to file complaints when mobile home park owners fail to meet such standards. As the Mobile Home Park Act currently reads, only mobile home owners or landlords can file complaints. Other residents who happen to rent their mobile homes cannot. In fact, 
The draft rules that DOLA issued last week include absolutely no details on the process of filing a complaint or what standard of pleading is necessary to file a complaint. Furthermore, retaliation is not defined under the act and mobile home park owners may be able to pass off the cost of violations to residents by raising their rents. For example, if a mobile home park owner agrees to pay for structural changes in the park during the dispute resolution process, nothing keeps the owner from deciding to raise rent by $100 in order to pay for the new structural changes that must be made. There are a number of other vital areas where members of the public can voice their opinions and ensure the act fulfills its intended purpose. Public comment on the proposed rules opens on October 10th. I urge the board to spread the word about the public comment period and to use its voice to advocate for Boulder's mobile home park residents. In the event that changes are not made to DOLA's draft rules, I ask that the Boulder Housing Advisory Board be prepared to step in and pass what ordinances it can to remedy the faults of the rules issued by DOLA. Thank you. Thank you, Leo. Thank you. Yeah, we might have some yeah. questions here. Um, so you're saying people can uh, contact somebody before October 10th or starting October 10th? You can contact DOLA now to help them as they draft the rules, but on October 10th, um, those are the official rules that DOLA is proposing to be made into like official rules that will be applied. And so the official public comment period opens on the 10th and is open till November 1st, I believe. Um, but if you contact, um, DOLA at this point, they are taking um, recommendations on their draft rules right and, now. And do you happen to have with you uh, that you can say out loud a link to do that or something? Or I can send you the contact information of who we're in contact with at DOLA, if that would be helpful. Um, I know his first name's Mo, but I can't <laughs> think of his last name. But for the public that's listening, they can just Google DOLA? And yes, it should be if you type in like Mobile Home Park Act dispute resolution um, rulemaking process, it should bring you to the link. There are a number of stakeholder meetings. Um, the clinic has been involved with those where DOLA is going to different mobile home parks and areas across Colorado to get feedback. Um, we've listened in to almost every single stakeholder meeting. They're getting feedback at those meetings too. Um, the one on Tuesday, so yesterday, was the first one where they had the draft rules. Um, they didn't really discuss any of the changes that we're concerned about at that meeting. So we're planning to make our voice heard through the law school um, before the draft rules are proposed for public comment and during the public comment period as well. Thank you. Uh, do they have uh, any initial draft rules that are available already for review or are they holding off till the 10th? Yes, they just came out with a set of draft rules last week. It's only about four pages, so it could be a quick read for everyone to look at. Um, it's should be up on their website. If not, I can also send that to y'all because it is publicly available, so I can send that in an email as well. Or we could ask Mo. Yes, yeah. Mo has okay. it, yeah, he has them, so. <laughs> yes. uh, do you know when the open comment period ends as well? I'm pretty sure it ends on November 1st, um, and there's a meeting on November 11th, I believe, um, where the rules are getting like voted on to be passed and then made into law, so I think you can also participate um, in that meeting as well. Um, but public comment period starts on the 10th and should last until November 1st. And Jay, do you think council is aware of this? Um, I do not know specifically. Um, I was gonna give you a card for um, one of my associates, Crystal Launder. Are you okay. familiar with her? We might be working with her okay. through the law school. We're, we're working with some Boulder um, people, yep. but I wanted to come in a more public place and kind of spread the word about it. Yep. No, that's but um, I know we're working with summer laws. Um, and some well, Crystal was involved in um, helping to um, pass. draft and pass. And I'm sure we're also working with her as well. But I'll give you your contact information okay. just in case. Yeah. This is just something I think we want to make sure council is aware of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you all. Appreciate it. I've got the link for your question for the record. Perfect. Any other public participation? That was it. Okay, thank you. We're gonna close public participation and move on to matters from council. Community benefit. Good evening, board members. So my name is Carl Geiler, I'm with the planning department. I'm gonna to present to you tonight um, the features of uh, the attached ordinance uh, to the packet related to the community benefit project. So this is phase one of the community benefit project. The goals of the project are basically to incentivize or require 
uh, additional community benefit in exchange for additional height, floor area, or density in certain projects in the city of Boulder. Uh, I wanna read the um, purpose statement uh, for the board. So consistent with newly adopted Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan policies, newly adopted means in 2017 basically, uh, staff will update the land use code to create regulations and incentives for obtaining certain community benefits when considering height modification requests and or additional floor area density requests and rezoning applications. So I'll talk about the um, portions of that uh, ordinance tonight related to affordable housing requirements for for sale and rental projects. There's also proposed regulations for commercial projects. And we also wanna have a discussion about Appendix J, which is the map in the land use code that specifies where height modification requests can be requested. And then we'll convey the Housing Advisory Board recommendation to City Council. So the questions to guide the discussion uh, are, uh, does HAB support new site review criteria that would require permanently affordable housing benefits in areas designated in Appendix J where a building exceeds the maximum height of a zoning district up to 55 feet. And then the second key issue is does HAB agree with the staff recommendation to continue to limit areas where height modifications may be sought to the areas shown in Appendix J, uh, again, entitled areas where height modifications may be considered at this time. So just going back in time, um, height has been a pretty important issue in the city of Boulder for years. Um, when you look at some of the taller buildings throughout the city, you can see that a lot of buildings in the 50s and 60s, and you had the uh, Williams Village project, a number of projects were going you know, up to around 100 feet or so, uh, and it caused the community to have some concern about those types of projects. And that led to a referendum in 1971 that was passed that basically set the maximum height limit for buildings in the city of Boulder at 55 feet. So I just wanna be really clear that we're not proposing to change that. Any change to that 55 foot height limit would require a you know, citizen vote. Um, so. <laughs> so um, since that time, the city has been considering um, requests for height above zoning district maximum. So all the different zoning districts have usually around 35 feet as a maximum. There are some zones that are 38 feet and some that are 40 feet, but generally, if any request comes in to go above that, it's considered a height modification up to the 55 feet maximum in the city charter. And I also wanted to just point out that that height measurement is actually from a low point 25 feet away from any structure. So if the slope descends away from a structure, that's gonna bring that, that height down further. So the city's been reviewing these for, for quite some time now. Uh, there aren't any specific community benefit requirements associated with height modifications. There's basically the site review criteria that talk about is the building proportional to other buildings in the area in terms of its height? Is its massing you know, and height compatible with the surrounding context? But nothing really beyond that uh, other than other design type criteria in the site review process. So. After there, were, uh, there was a proliferation of height modifications that were approved leading up to the Great Recession and then built where there was quite a few coming online around the same time. And that caused some concern in the community leading to the council at that time passing an interim development regulation that established the Appendix J, basically where um, height modifications can be requested. Uh, it also became a topic of the Boulder Valley Commerce of Plan update that was going on uh, in 2015. Uh, and that was around that same time. So when the, the comp plan was actually adopted in 2017, it included new policies related to community benefit and height, and I'll talk about those. I also want to point out that council uh, last year in 2018 extended the sunset date for that interim development regulation to May of 2020. And then just to come up to more recent history, uh, council in April of this year requested that we take the community benefit project and basically break it into two parts and have phase one and phase two, and that phase one would focus primarily on permanently affordable housing and additional height. So that's basically what we're talking about tonight. 
So just to clarify on uh, Appendix J, again, the sunset date is May 31st, 2020. The areas in red are those areas where you can ask for a height modification. Doesn't mean it's an automatic approval, it just means you can ask for it through a site review project. Uh, it still would require um, consistency with the site review uh, criteria. It would require a, a planning board hearing and action uh, by the planning board. It could be called up to council. Um, again, no community benefit requirements are applied to those particular uh, applications. There are some exemptions to the red areas which are listed up on the slide. So uh, you can see those four additional citywide eligibility criteria. So if you have an in, in an industrial zone, if you have a building that's no more than two stories, you can ask for a height modification. If you need that additional height for manufacturing, you can ask uh, for a height modification. Uh, if you have topography on a site that descends away from the building that makes it overly restrictive to even add the, uh, the generally by right number of stories, you can ask for a height modification. Uh, and if more than 40% or 40% or more of the floor area of a project is devoted to permanently affordable housing, you can ask for a height modification anywhere in the city uh, and then emergency operations antenna. So I talked about uh, the policy guidance that, that went uh, into play in 2017 with basically three new policies that relate to this. So there's enhanced community benefit that basically says that if there's any land use or zoning changes that result in increased density or intensity of development beyond that what's normally allowed through the zoning, uh, that community benefit uh, is expected in a, in a project. And, the policy even goes as far as identifying some of the community benefits that we've been exploring. So obviously, affordable housing, affordable commercial space, space for the arts, uh, public art, uh, a number of other things have been identified and we're still uh, looking at those. There's also a uh, policy 2.35 that relates specifically to building height, saying that there's an expectation for some benefits back to the community for additional height. Uh, and then 7.11 is specific to affordable housing saying that that's expected uh, as, a, as a benefit for any kind of additional uh, intensity. So we've done uh, some updates with uh, the board in the past uh, leading up to the study session that we had uh, with city council in September of last year. So basically these are the identified community benefits and we had done a number of case studies of other jurisdictions and laid out some ideas of how these could all become part of the code ultimately and we got good feedback from, from the board and planning board and, and council at that time uh, before we moved into the, the phase one portion. So our goal through this process is to try to come up with regulations that are gonna be you know, feasible through, through the market economy. So um, we have had, uh, we've consulted with a uh, Kaiser Marston um, as a consultant on, on the economic piece. Uh, the goals basically are, you know, not trying to get something that's reasonable. So getting community benefit requirements that um, are not too arduous as to deter development so you don't get community benefits, but also not making it so marginal that we get a bunch of projects and get marginal community benefit. So the, we've been trying to balance this throughout the course of this um, to, to get that right mix. So the results of the um, economic analysis that's found in attachment C by Kaiser Marston, uh, they looked at basically uh, base projects, which is basically by right, basically three stories uh, within FAR, um, and then looked at bonus projects where there's FAR, where there's basically floor area above the FAR or height, um, and they looked at residential and non-residential projects. So as the board knows, you know, right today, our, our current requirement is that there's the 25% inclusionary housing requirement that applies um, for projects that, that have residential. Um, they found that the market could support a higher amount of affordable housing in bonus area. So in their findings, 36% uh, of the inclusionary housing requirement uh, could apply to for sale projects with 50% of the IH units being on site. Uh, and they found that any, a higher uh, percentage could be supported for a rental project at 41%. Just for the sake of the audience, can you remind everyone what those numbers are based off of the 1 million at 15% margin, profit margin? Oh yeah, so when they were looking at, um, 
projects, they were looking at performas. And the goal was to try to have some, a basic amount of return for a developer enough that they would be attracted to doing a project. So the, the study basically said that there would have to be at least 50% or potentially 1 million uh, as, as an uh, amount of money to make a project feasible. So they looked at the cost of doing the development and they subtracted it out so that everything would equal to that 15% or 1 million. And that's what informed these numbers. They basically found that you know when a project goes above the height limit and adds floor area, that it adds basically 25% to the value of the project. So there is that this is basically supported uh, was the findings of the report. So for non-residential projects. Um, the 36%, 50%, 41%, that's of the total project, not just the additional theoretical two stories, right? The the 36%, I'll get to this when we talk okay. about the ordinance, okay. but the 36% basically applies to just the bonus floor area. Okay, that's my question. Mm -hmm. So today, if a project comes in and it's in a commercial project, there's what we, we have commercial linkage fees or what, what's in the code as the capital facility impact um, tax. So it's based on whatever uses are within the building uh, times the floor area. So that would still apply for the, the base level floor area. They found in the study that there could be an additional amount of that linkage fee for the bonus floor area. They found that for, for office, there could be an additional 43% uh, supported for that bonus floor area. And even more so for a hotel, they found that 116% uh, could apply in that instance. So before I go deep into the, the ordinance, I just wanna talk a little bit about the background of the project and the outreach. So since um, even before the study sessions, we've done a number of different techniques of getting the word out on the community benefit project. We, had a number of open houses early part of this year and going even further back, we had set up, I believe it was like eight or more focus groups with different uh, neighbors in the community, the development community. Uh, we've met with small group sessions. We had uh, the Be Heard Boulder questionnaire uh, that we put out. We had the What's, What's Up Boulder event. We've presented to um, ULI, Better Boulder, the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we did a, a survey um, with the Housing, uh, the Human Services Alliance. So there's been a lot of methods of getting input on this project as we've moved along. Um, so looking back at the, the comp plan update, uh, there was a statistically valid survey that was done at that time related to community benefit and height. And in 2016, it basically found that you could see most of the respondents of that survey were opposed to additional height uh, but when the question asked if there was community benefits associated with that additional height, you could see that the community was more receptive um, to the additional height. You can see the green, you know, it's not, it's not over half. But you can see it, if you include the kind of the neutral, it's about 50% of folks were, were receptive to that. So we did a Be Heard Boulder questionnaire. No, so again, not a statistically valid survey. Uh, we didn't have nearly as many respondents, but the interesting thing is that this, this year we did get a, a similar response to that where it was asking about community benefit, affordable housing, and height. And you can see that the, the amount of support and opposition is, is relatively close to that, um, the other uh, survey that was done. I have a quick question. Um, do, can you tell me just off of both of them uh, how many people responded? Uh, I don't have off the top of my head the, the statistically valid survey from the comp plan, but. With the, with the latest Be Heard Boulder, it was, I think it was over 300 respondents. So as far as the maybes, uh, there were, we, we had a bunch of comments, comment boxes where they, they, where they would, if, to show what they would need for it to, to work would be like design and compatibility. There's a number of things that would have to work out with it. Uh, they would have to be enforceable and permanent. Uh, it depends on the location and context. Uh, something tangible, it'd have to stay with the project. Uh, so there were some caveats to people supporting this program. But overall, like the things that we've heard through the, the outreach is that affordable housing is the right priority. It's the number one priority. Uh, neighborhood context and compatibility is crucial. Um, imbalancing the requirements and incentives may le lead to less affordable housing that gets at what I was talking about before, that we, we need to calibrate it the right way to 
encourage projects and in order to get those community benefits. On-site units were preferable. Uh, and then long-term benefits, something that was locked in with the project was important. So now I'll move on to the proposed ordinance. Uh, what I'm gonna cover uh, is the, the new code language uh, related to affordable housing, um, and then talk a little bit about the Appendix J map. And then also there's two additional community benefits that we'll discuss real briefly, the nursing homes and assisted living uh, and an alternative community benefit. So first off, uh, the ordinance is found within attachment A. So when we were looking at this project, we realized that there, the code already has what we call land use intensity modifications. So there are limited options in the code for going over floor area, going over density in certain zones that's already set up. And there's specific criteria that has to be met to do that. So we felt that the community benefit project was similar, that if you're asking for additional height, that there be very clear criteria as to what the city would get um, in exchange. So we felt that height for fourth and fifth stories uh, in certain areas could be considered a land use intensity modification. So the ordinance is proposed to include that language in the site review criteria as a land use intensity modification. So again, Everything is informed by the, the Kaiser Marston study. Um, and the, the reason uh, we're going with a lot of their recommendations is that by tying it to the bonus area, it makes, makes it that it is, it's basically proportional to how much they're adding. So if they're adding, the more they add above the height limit or above a floor area limit, the more community benefit the city would be getting. So the requirement basically, as we talked about, the base area is 20, I just have a question. I was, can you go back one slide? Yeah, the bottom one, I have to say, I was still listen, I was still thinking about the top three. Could you repeat that alternative community benefit again? Oh, we, we wanted to include um, an option for an alternative community benefit if it was a something that wasn't clearly identified but could would be a clear uh, benefit to the community related to like fire services, police oh. services government services that are essential, um, that there would be an option in, in the ordinance to enable someone to, to request that. Someone could actually work with, with the city on what the city needs, and that would enable that okay. to, to, to happen. Thank you. So we talked about the base requirement for um, residential projects. What staff is recommending is that the ordinance would require that any bonus floor area above the height limit would be subject to the higher inclusionary housing standard, so it would be 36%. Uh, we've also added language in, in the proposed ordinance that would require for for sale projects that 50% of all the affordable units would be on the site. So again, uh, commercial linkage fees apply to the base area. And then going along with the recommendation from Kaiser Marston, for the bonus area above the height, uh, you would take that commercial linkage fee requirement for the use and you would add 43% to it for that uh, bonus floor area. So just to get an... I have another question. On the one that says the IH requirement would increase to 36% for sale projects would provide 50% of all housing units on site. What is it for rentals? The rental would just be cash in lieu and it would be based on that 36% in the bonus floor area. It would be cash in lieu and it doesn't require any on, on site on those two floors? Yeah, so you, if you remember, Judy, so the state prohibition on rent control means that the city cannot require rental projects to provide the units on site. But they can offer it, right, as long as they offer those three or four? They could enter into a voluntary agreement, but if we required it, we would be running afoul of the state prohibition. But it will, the, the ordinance will make available all the options? Yes. Okay. It's just not a requirement. Okay. So if this were implemented, we wanted to give the board um, some idea of what the city would be getting in return. So for a for sale project, you can see on the left a buy right project, uh, 10 on site units, cash and lieu fee around 700,000. Um, if you go to a bonus project with 50% of the IH units on the site, you get four additional affordable units in a project. 
you get an additional 400,000 in cash in lieu uh, for those that are not on site. So the total would then go up to $1.1 million in 14 on site units. And we can come back to these if, if the board wants. So the rental example, there'd be 3 million uh, cash in lieu. And then with the additional story, it'd be 1.4 million additional in cash in lieu for a total of 4.5 million. When we get into the commercial example, again, this is based on the fees that would kick in in 2021. Uh, the linkage fee under that would be 2.7 million for that floor area. And then adding on that additional story would get an additional 900,000 in the linkage fee for a total of nearly uh, $4 million. So just to be really clear about uh, bonus floor area, again, driving the point home, these are not allowing buildings that are gonna be taller than 55 feet, that's not the case at all. Um, we're also showing five stories here, which is also relatively rare. Um, most developers wanna have taller headroom in their units, so you end up getting you know, four stories or you have the, the, the low point that's away from the building kind of pulls that down. So you can see that the crosshatch to the, the, the right is the height bonus, so any floor area that's in a fourth or fifth story that's either partially or wholly above the height limit is height bonus area, but there's also some floor area that might be above the FAR. So there's a number of limited scenarios that we added uh, in the ordinance based on the Kaiser Marson study about certain zones that some additional floor area up to um, around 1.0 FAR um, for some zones that have a lower FAR at 0.6 or in the BR zone, which has a limitation on dwelling units per acre Anything that goes above those limits would also be considered bonus floor area in this ordinance and would they would have to meet those requirements for that. We've also included, based on some uh, recommendations from the community about some leeway for encouraging uh, pitched roofs without having a community benefit requirement to encourage gable roofs. So we've added an exemption, exemption that if you're just doing three stories and you're doing a pitched roof no taller than 10 feet above the height limit that uh, you could ask for uh, height modification without having to meet these requirements. Real quick, that's part of the suggested changes? Yes. Okay. So is that the only uh, design variation where you're making that accommodation? So in other words, if I just had a, a design, it's still three stories, but higher ceilings, like you mentioned, or something else, that wouldn't be, that wouldn't qualify for that exemption? Yeah, no other design variations at this time. We might look at some additional ones as we move into phase two. Okay. So I talked a little bit about the Appendix J map. Um, what we're proposing at this point is um, when we brought Appendix J to the City Council in at the study session, we asked the question about whether or not this should be repealed um, as part of this particular project. Uh, the council at the time uh, basically said to us that they didn't uh, agree that it should be repealed um, at the end of this project until such time that they see the, the, the impact or the, how it plays out, seeing some examples on the ground before um, pulling out uh, Appendix J, if that's what they opt to do. Uh, we also have found that Appendix J is useful in basically making it really clear about where height modifications can occur. They're generally in areas that are governed by area plans and, air and zoning districts that anticipate additional height. So, so based on the, the feedback we got from council on that, uh, we're recommending that it stay in place at this time with no changes. We might ask this question again at the end of phase two, depending on where things land and maybe after some examples are built about whether it should be uh, repealed or kept in the code. Uh, we, we are recommending um, that the sunset date be removed. Um, a new sunset date could be added as an alternative uh, but we're curious to hear uh, what the board has to say about that. So lastly, um, while we were going through this, we were looking at the commercial linkage fees that are in the code, and we noticed that there's a specific uh, commercial linkage fee that's applied to nursing homes and assisted living, and we felt that that particular use shouldn't be penalized by additional the additional 43%. So what we're proposing is basically listing this as a community benefit use and not making that particular use have to pay the additional commercial linkage fee above the height. 
Uh, so that's included in the ordinance. And as we talked about before, the alternative community benefit would create an option um, for a unforeseen or unexpected uh, community benefit that might be an obvious uh, benefit to the community. So how come you would consider nursing homes and assisted living but not like transitional facilities or um, anything along that line? We, we, again, we, we went off of what were specific uses that were listed in the capital facilities tax. Because those weren't specifically listed, we didn't include it. Mm. It's totally possible that we might go down that road as we look at human services as part of phase two and add more. Right. But this just seemed like an obvious one to, to add to the list. Um, so a lot of other communities have alternative community benefit requirement options. So we felt it appropriate to add it to this uh, particular ordinance. So we, we presented this to planning board last week. Uh, the planning board did not recommend that the ordinance move forward. We should point out there were four members of planning board at that meeting. And, and again, Brian's here tonight if there's any questions. Um, they did support the concept behind the ordinance. Uh, but they, they wanted to suggest some additional changes uh, for council that related to other mechanisms in the code to encourage uh, permanently affordable housing beyond uh, just the site review process, uh, looking at some other prescriptive changes to the code that would make it really clear about density and intensity changes in exchange for more affordability, um, modifying the height calculations to be more flexible for like roof access for roof decks. Um, recommendations to do um, a sunset date if Appendix J uh, needed to stay in the code. I, I will point out that this also did not pass. It was a three to one vote, um, but we were conveying this uh, to city council uh, along with the, the HAB recommendation. So at this point, um, the schedule has changed a little bit. Uh, we have community benefits set for city council on first reading on October 1st. That's still the same, except uh, council has requested that the, p the public hearing occur on that date. So that's the latest information we have is that that will be actually the public hearing. And then if they were to make any changes to the ordinance, that could be considered on second reading on October 15th. And that could potentially be on uh, consent, depending on how uh, that goes with council. And then moving past that, we'll, we'll be moving into phase two where we explore the other uh, community benefits and figuring out how to add those to the list that we've already set up uh, in the attached ordinance. So I'll conclude with the questions for HAB and happy to answer any questions. So let's do just questions from each person first and then uh, we'll talk about how we want to approach this. Could we also, if everybody's in agreement with it, I'd love to hear what <coughs> planning board a little bit more from Brian before we go launch into questions. Sure. If everybody is okay with that. Absolutely. I've prepared a 45 minute presentation, so. <laughs> yeah, try to be shorter than last night, Brian. I wanna, yeah, I wanna outdo Carl, He's only at 39. Um, uh, I think I wanna sort of stick to the crux issues for planning board. Um, you know, with a board of four, um, it really requires a unanimous vote to act. So knowing from the beginning that we had a uh, strong disagreement over Appendix J meant that it was pretty clear that unless people were willing to um, compromise on that, that we weren't gonna have a motion to support what staff recommended, kind of regardless of what kind of discussion we had. <clears throat> and, you know, a lot of us felt like, can you say a lot if there's only four of you? <laughs> a portion of the group <laughs> felt like um, you know, the, the deal with Appendix J was, in, you know, I was there when we were doing this the first time around during the uh, moratorium. Um, Appendix J has not uh, benefited from any public input uh, in its generation, nor is it a result of a planning process. It was a, the sort of writing down of projects that people would think of that they knew were in the pipeline, like, oh, the Armory is coming or the Fraser Meadows is coming, and then some places that had area plans and uh, downtown, and then they hooked downtown being added to the Appendix J uh, as a result of the completion of the rewriting of the downtown urban design guidelines, which those are part of doing as well. And um, so the, so Appendix J was a sort of main sticking point 
And <clears throat> some of us were under the sort of expectation, the newer folks were under the expectation that, or maybe one of them, that the discussion should be only limited to areas inside Appendix J. Um, so several of us felt like Appendix J should be taken away immediately, or at least sunset in, Oct in uh, March of 2020, is that when it is? It's May 2020. May 2020. Um, uh, and not be prolonged any further. Um, it was initially put in as a temporary stopgap measure, um, sold as, as the idea would last two years, and it's been extended once, and to extend it again feels like, you know, to me personally, speaking for myself, and maybe a few other people on the board that night, um, disingenuous in terms of process. Um, so Appendix J was a big sticking point. Um, there has been support since I've been on planning board, for sure, um, of looking at the site review criteria and taking a, a look at how can we make them uh, clear to predict for applicants, for the community, and for planning board, so you know how to make a decision, and it's not really s quite so subjective. Um, and some of those questions that have been raised over the years were things like the language around minimize, minimize and mitigate, um, and um, how you deal with height and stuff like that. So we've been trying to work on that for quite some time. So I think the idea that this project would apply broadly to the site review criteria is pretty well supported around the town. Um, planning board certainly agreed that height was the um, highest priority, or sorry, affordable housing was the highest priority in terms of uh, community benefit, and we should focus on that. So everyone's very comfortable with that. Um, and then what we tried to do was pull together a motion that um, we thought rec represented everyone's input well enough to, um, in light of the fact that we weren't gonna act that night, send something to council to, so that they could actually use it. And the motion language that we put together was pretty close to what Carl had up on there on the screen. Um, and I think there were some pretty interesting things. I mean, one, one of the kind of lynch pins for the conversation also was the, you know, when we wrote the section on enhanced community benefit for the comp plan last time around, which is section 1.11, enhanced community benefit, um, that uh, Carl referred to in his presentation. Um, when we were contemplating this project, we wrote in that for land use or zoning district changes that result in increases in the density or intensity of development beyond what's permitted by the underlying zoning or, or, added, or for added height, that increases intensity, we would be looking at community benefit. And so there was a pretty strong sentiment on the board that um, without looking at uh, intensity and density increases, which are actually the meat of the comp plan criteria that we all wrote and approved, it wasn't actually on the mark in terms of being a policy we could support. So that was the other big piece for us, is it doesn't actually do enough to really incentivize actually getting affordable housing. Um, there are places in which it does allow some additions to intensity and density, which Carl can explain, I don't remember. Um, too much to memorize all these things. Um, I begin to like erase these memory tapes as soon as the meeting's <laughs> over, rewriting. Um, so, uh, but I do think that the, um, the shift has been more towards how do we make it harder to get height modifications as opposed to how do we really incentivize affordable housing. So that lens, I think, is a problematic one for planning board. Um, and, uh, we, yeah, so these are um, the things that we talked about, and they had b pretty broad support. I think the tricky one um, was, uh, the trickiest one of these was actually the modify height calculations to allow uh, roof decks. Um, and the way we were looking at that was, um, you know, over the seven and a half years I've been on planning board, um, and then as an applicant a number of times before that, you know, trying to figure out how do you get occupiable spaces on the roof, places for green roofs, um, places for people to, to be together, um, and everyone loves the downtown, you know, rooftop bars and stuff like that, or community places where you've got rooftop access. So one of the big, yeah, yeah, so I mean, one of the big barriers to that is um, once you have a building that's near its 35 foot height limit, um, you can't get a stair headroom above that, you can't put an enclosure above that to walk out on that roof, or an elevator stop that's enclosed to walk out on that roof. Um, so this was an intent just to allow just those, just enough floor area above the height limit to allow rooftop access, not like uh, additional stories. Um, so that was kind of our, our thought on that. Um, and we were kind of just piggybacking that on the pitched roof idea um, because it's been percolating for a long time. Uh, there was, I think, complete support for the first two ideas, which were um, 
how do you, uh, the idea of basically saying, uh, along with, by right, um, intensity and density uh, imp increases for affordable housing projects, you could then apply the similar criteria for height modifications through site review for that. So there are a couple of zones in the city that um, have by right density increases for affordable housing. Um, Holiday Neighborhood is the best example of that, where if you go, when you go from um, back then 20% affordable housing IH to 40% affordable housing, you got a double density bonus. So it went from 10 DU per acre to 20 DU per acre net. So after you take out the roads and stuff. Um, and that results in you getting affordable housing built. So we've learned a lot over the years of what, what actually works and what doesn't really work. And I think you know, in terms of incentivizing affordable housing, I think the planning board felt like, and I certainly feel like that as a sort of practicing professional here, a little bit more height's not gonna make people build affordable housing. That's, that was a big part of why we didn't support it. So, but if you make the, um, the transaction of, um, and this is a kind of a key thing, to, a key answer to what Jay was pointing out, in terms of getting, I know I'm working on going to like 49 minutes, I know, but um, if, if, you, um, if you're applying discretionary review and trying to um, ask an applicant to provide affordable housing on site, we don't really have the ability to do that. What we do have the ability to do is, to do is say, if you provide affordable housing on site, you get more units, you get more FAR, you get more intensity somehow, or height. Um, and then it's a transaction that's legal. So we're sort of like always looking away from the one that works and under these other things. But I think the idea that we had here was like, let's apply the one that works broadly and still consider the way staff's put together um, can we benefit tied to height. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, so I think that's probably all I need to say about that unless you guys have other questions for me. I had one question for yeah, you. Yeah. So the basis being that you don't think 15% return or a million dollar return is enough oh. to incentivize people to build A million dollars stories. would be great for me, but um, I think the, uh, the numbers that go into that, um, and I didn't, honestly, I didn't dive into the report uh, well enough, but um, typically uh, if the height doesn't go along with an increase in floor area, there is no economic benefit, right? So if you, if you can build 15 units and they're all 1,000 square feet, you got a 15,000 square foot building, um, the only economic benefit to going taller is you save a little bit of money on foundations. But in our area, you know, when you switch from three floors to four floors, you're buying yourself an elevator. So <clears throat> with that in height increase by building code, you're also gonna be spending 30 grand per floor on an elevator. So um, that might counter out if you've got a big enough project but you got to keep in mind those, the math that they were doing was on sort of a particular project size. So if we're doing a project that's a four unit neighborhood, you know, or a eight unit pocket neighborhood, um, those kinds of numbers are not going to happen in that kind of environment. Yep. So specifically, like if you wanted to do a, um, you know, 12 unit, um, let's say you've got a piece of property that's zoned for uh, eight units, all of the, um, boards and bodies that have to approve this thing have, have said you can get a density bonus of 50% if you make them all affordable, um, then you know Habitat or somebody could come in and say, well, we're gonna do 12 littler units um, and take advantage of that by right density bonus and it would create affordable housing because it, then it would pencil better. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay, uh, questions from the board? Do we wanna go? Yeah, Dan. So my other question just trying to uh, understand the sentiment of the planning board regarding Exhibit J. So mm -hmm. was the feeling that it's too restrictive and if we're gonna have this, we should look at it from a broader perspective because there wasn't such an empirical process to establish it in the first place and so maybe step that away and if we look at things on a case-by-case -case basis, whether or not it merits, uh, makes more sense. That's kind of what I got from you, but I'm not sure. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's pretty fair. And I, I wanna be really careful in how I represent the full board. Um, there were, people who felt like, really kind of one person who felt like um, our job at this moment was to stay inside the confines of um, the areas allocated on Appendix J, which I don't think is really the scoping that staff has been giving. I just don't think that's accurate. Um, I think everyone agreed that Appendix J um, is just factually not a document that went through any kind of public process. Right. Um, it wasn't put out 
through any of the things that these guys have done ever. Um, it's been carried along behind them on things and it's been adopted into the um, land use code, but it hasn't ever, it wasn't generated through a planning process or through a public engagement process. So as a result, it doesn't really, rep you know, it doesn't actually, I mean, if you were to think about this from a, I mean, if we asked each other, okay, so where, where might it make sense to be able to have uh, increased height or intensity for affordable housing along in the city of Boulder, I think pretty early in that conversation would uh, come up places like that are transit rich, right? That's not a map of transit rich locations, um, stuff like that. Okay, thanks, it's helpful. I had a question. Um, so when you say there's no been, been no public input, did anybody come to planning board to speak about area, the, the, Jay? No, I forgot. Since that would be over the past six years or five <laughs> years since the moratorium, I can't say whether or not people have. I'm come in talking specifically that. at the last meeting that you had about community benefits, since it was part of your discussion. Yeah, I, do you recall if somebody spoke directly about Appendix J? Like I don't recall. No, yeah. that that anyone said anything about Appendix J. I mean, mostly people were talking about the broader policy, right? It's possible, yeah. Your mic's not on. Yeah, so I believe what I what I heard from one of the board members and and from I think one member of the public public was that um, there's an expectation among the community that it was only going to apply to Appendix J, um, the community benefit, and that that was sort of the expectation from the onset. So I think there was some that was part of the reaction to opening it up broader than that yeah and a desire to you know well let's use this as a test area how do we let's see how it works in the appendix j areas and then in the next phase we can reevaluate whether or not we want to broaden it so mm -hmm. i think that's, I think, I think that's, that's a fair representation i think i mean the other representation that's probably worth making is that there's a lot of folks who um, i mean the whole process so far has been have had a presumption that there was a sunset date first two years ago and now in the spring. And then, you know, uh, so I think the, there may have been expectations that that the uh, um, Appendix J would last forever, but the fact is that we actually said it wasn't going to. <laughs> That's why there's a written down sunset, that sunset date for it. Sure, okay. Questions? I'm not there yet. Danny? Uh, questions or comments? We knew both. Okay. Um, well, I think just in concept, the whole the whole structure and concept, uh, I think is a great idea. You know, this is my third meeting. We've already had uh, a lot of discussion, including our listening session last month, about what kind of mechanisms could we put in place to really incentivize and to you know increase the opportunities to uh, uh, you know secure uh, more affordable housing. And I think this is certainly one of them. And this is uh, something that can be very effective. Uh, within that general auspice, I think there is uh, certainly a concern regarding a how it how it applies, uh, you know, on the ground, and b how it's limited in, in terms of how those limits affect the impact. And so, I guess my my question would be, you know, I, I do I would share some concerns regarding the notion of Appendix J, just because those are certain areas where there's been this. Um, you know, height allowance or height allowance process for some time, apparently. And, um, you know, we're just adding this additional uh, requirement to something that's already been there. And I think looking at this from a broader policy perspective, I think there's a good idea to say, what additional criteria do we need that we could implement rather than just have Appendix J that would say where it's appropriate and where it's not appropriate. I know we already have a set of criteria. Maybe there's additional criteria. Whatever was applied to come up with Appendix J in the first place maybe can be something that's um, been articulated in the ordinance itself and in the criteria that can you know take the place of, of Appendix J. Um, but I, I think the whole notion of height as a vehicle to uh, incentivize additional affordable housing is a, a, a great concept. And, you know, the first TDR programs ever in this country focused on height rather than just density and, and sprawl. And so I think it's the, um, 
it's, it certainly uh, has a lot of merit and it's certainly a good approach to take, but I think just the whole notion of how we go about doing it is something that you know, probably needs a little more fine tuning, it seems like to me. And I would just say, um, I, I think the other part, just from, from the experience of a developer, uh, and I think Brian, what you were saying too, is that, you know, that whole notion of, you know, what can be done on the front end, because every developer, when they're looking to pencil something out, right, additional discretionary processes or something that they're gonna shy away from, if they can make that determination where they're penciling everything out right from the beginning, it might make it more effective in terms of saying, we're gonna buy this land, we're gonna develop it, here's a plan for five stories. Uh, if there's less process and more certitude that's reflected in the ordinance and something that certainly secures the things that we want to accomplish there, I think that could be very effective as well. So that's my initial thoughts. Um, first of all, Carl, thank you. I thought that was really comprehensible and these things are sometimes so hard. I listen to planning board meetings and city council meetings and I hardly know what they're talking about sometimes and I could really understand what you were saying, so thank you. Um, I, I do have a question. When you talk about affordable housing, I don't hear the word permanently affordable housing, so I'm wondering how staff sees that. Uh, it the, would be permanently affordable housing. It would be? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, then. I will now make my comments. Um, I, I'm not comfortable with the piece about exempting senior facilities right now because we're all well, well aware that there have been some luxury senior facilities and assisted living, and I'm not interested in giving them a break. So if some wording could be added to that exemption that would say something like, um, uh, I don't know, um, uh, nursing homes and um, assisted living facilities are exempt only if they already meet some criteria to provide affordable housing for low-income older adults or something. Uh, that, that's one thing. Um, the other is, I think the idea of looking at other uses outside of J are useful at some point in the future, but I think right now this was presented as such, and it's the community's expectation that it's just about Jay. So um, that's my position on that. Otherwise, I thought you did a really good job, and I think there's some great things in there that are really helpful. Um, a couple of questions I have. Uh, and the first one I wanna start with is something that Brian said that wasn't quite on my radar. The increase in height, if I understood correctly, is not necessarily tied to an increase in FAR. Is this what we were talking about last night? The confusion that everybody was feeling last night when we were talking about, um, Jesus, what was the meeting last night? Alpine Balsam. And everybody was talking about FAR and height as well. And the confusion for the audience, so if you could Nail that down. Yeah, I'll shed some light on that. So um, there are some zoning districts that don't have an FAR limit. Mm -hmm. There are some zoning districts that don't have a density limit. There's all these other factors and zoning regs that determine you know, the project and everything. But then there's some zoning districts that do have an FAR limit and, and do have a dwelling units per acre limit or a, um, a certain amount of lot area for per dwelling unit that can create some restrictions of, of doing projects. So when the econ economic study was done, they found that in general across the city, these projects would be feasible when granted a height modification, but there were certain zones where it might be a little bit more on the marginal side about whether a developer would even do it. So again, trying to create that appropriately balanced piece, we looked at the zones that create those barriers and, and they had suggested that if there were zoning districts that were below a 1.0 FAR and there's quite a few zones that only allow 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, that those be allowed an additional amount of FAR up to around 1.0 to make them more feasible. Um, another thing that was highlighted was the BR1 zoning district. So this is the area around where like 29th Street is. 
So the comp plan right now talks about and has policies about increasing housing capacity in that area. And the thing that we've heard over and over again from developers and property owners, and again from the economist, is that the 1,600 square feet of land area per dwelling unit caps out the dwelling units to a point where it's, it's not that attractive to, to do residential. So in that case, we added a, a, an exemption in there where up 40% of, of a 50% increase in the density there in terms of dwelling units per acre could be requested as part of this project to make those projects more feasible. So what this graphic basically shows is that in most cases, the height bonus is gonna be on a fourth or fifth story, but there might be some cases where it might be on like a third story because it's area in excess of that dwelling units per acre or FAR. And that would be included in the bonus area. And they're not double counted. Yes. Uh, just, I want to make one, if it's okay, if I make one quick comment. Yeah. Um, it's, I think there's sort of a, when we look at these diagrams, there's sort of like an assumption I think everyone makes that like <clears throat> everywhere in town is going to be filled up to 35 feet sort of uniformly on the full block, which is sort of part of the Alpine Balsam conversation we had last night. Mm -hmm. um, and that uh, these might poke above that, but there's actually a lot of zones um, where you're only limited to, you know, basically one or two stories, like DT1, the town, downtown zone is FAR of 1.0. And so, and it's a, it's a zero lot line area, right, downtown. So you have to build to the walls on the side and the street in the front. And so you've, a 1.0 FAR results in a one story building in our downtown. And the zoning does allow for a density bonus there to encourage housing, just housing in general. Doesn't, it's not tied to affordable housing or anything of 50%. So if you have a, you know, uh, 3,000 square foot small lot downtown, um, well, the density bonus you could get is to put like a 1,500 square foot home on top of that full lot size commercial area. Um, so it's, there's like some stuff that's built in the code now that's like, that emulates this, I think. Um, so the logic's already there, but really, I mean, in, even in the downtown zone, that's a one story, it's a one and a half story building that's the, the big give. get back on track on what I was, sorry about that. No, that's okay, it was all good, I just, um, there's plenty more along that. I think the gist of what I'm getting at and what I felt when I was reading through this also, and I think Danny was alluding to and Brian, is the discretionary aspect also makes it difficult on the front end. You know, it's like, well, there are these things that may allow a developer to do this, and I think this is one of our big speed bumps in a sense, um, or hurdles, is the discretionary aspect. And so I also have concerns about that being kind of the condition that's in place here to a certain degree. The discretionary aspect coming from? Well, so yeah. in other words, like for instance, you could ask for a 50% increase in floor area or something. So. And, and that, as Danny was saying, then a developer is like, well, okay, so I've got to get into this process. I don't know what the outcome is going to be, and I think mm -hmm. it makes it difficult. Yeah. You know, I deal with this on a small scale with in single family houses, but you know, we, we have some of that also. And it always makes it a little bit difficult because you don't quite know what you're going to get when you come out. And it, it's, it's hard, I imagine, with these big projects, yeah. which I'm not familiar with. I'm going to avoid chiming in every time somebody talks, but. That's a really, I think it's a really important piece that I didn't say when I was talking about this before that you both have picked up on, which is that before anything comes in front of planning board or anybody else, there's um, a piece of property that comes up on the market. And the affordable housing developer, whether it's, you know, Thistle or Habitat or Boulder Housing Coalition or Boulder Housing Partners, any of the people whose main mission is to, to get city money, um, housing money, and or LIHTC funds and execute a affordable housing project that lines up with the comp plan, which is what we say we want, um, if we can give them essentially an advantage at the point of sale um, that they can count on, then it's gonna happen. Um, if it has to go, and it, they're just rolling the dice and they may get it and they may not, it sort of depends on if there's like, you know, four planning board members at the meeting or seven, 
there's like all kinds of stuff that goes on. Um, it's really unreliable, and and they need to be able to be uh, create those transactions quickly because they're competing in a real estate market that's super hot here. So if you've got a developer who's just doing um, able to hold land for a long time or um, able to um, you know sort of develop at a, a luxury level, then if you give the affordable housing guy the ability to say, I know I can get 14 units when they say it's 10, I can take this money and, and move it forward. So you want this as an automatic, not as a part of the site review process? Right, yeah, it'd, it'd be just, it would, I mean, that's my suggestion would be to make it emulate the other zones in which we do this, like DT1 has a 50% bonus and you, yep. you don't have to go through a good discretionary review, it's just if you're doing housing at administrative level, you can ask for that and they would say yes if you're complying with the criteria. Um, holiday zones, like if you um, provide 40% of affordable housing on site, then you get the density bonus. Um, if the parcel's big enough, or if you're asking for height or a parking reduction over a certain amount or all the other site review thresholds, it could still go through site review for sure, and we would do whatever we usually do, but um, it would be something that they could bank on um, in, in the financing mindset. Gotcha. Terry? Am, am I missing it? But it seems to me that this proposal is, is creating certainty, isn't it? Can't take them anywhere. It's working in that direction. I, you know, I was going to point out that another charge of the community benefit project has been to look at the site review criteria and try to write them in a way that's a little more prescriptive. Yeah, exactly. Kind of like the form-based code. So that that's it's already underway. That's going to be part of phase two. Okay. Uh, but that was intended to make the process or move towards a little yeah. bit more predictability. Yeah, because currently you go, you want a height exception, you go into site review, and then it's a dance, right? Then it's, well, we're not sure how much in this. It seems to me that this proposal, and I'm not saying I agree with it, but this proposal at least gives the, the, the property a certainty of, okay, well, if you want four stories, you can have it, but you got to go to whatever, 44% of this or that, right? So this, it seems to me that this is giving the process certainty, this proposal versus before when you go into site review and you want a bonus or whatever you want, then it's, there's no, there's no, you it, just have to see. It's moving in that direction. It's, yeah. you know, the project is still gonna be subject to other site review. Of course, criteria, of course, of course. But at least this updated. gives, this gives a developer some tangible number that they know, okay, if I wanna go four stories or five stories, then I, I know that this is the deal versus the way it is now where that's not the case. Right. So what I'd shift with that though, my, I guess my concern would be, especially when we talk about other community benefits, when you start talking about those things, when, when you start graying up the marks that you need to try to achieve, you know, so site, site plan is ministerial, right? And so if you check off all these boxes, you know, you can have a reasonable uh, expectation of approval with the site plan because it's less discretionary. But within that, you know, I guess the whole notion is if we have something that's concrete, and, I, and I'm, I'm, you know, and I'm, I think that's just kind of the direction we need to go. I'm not saying that we're not trying to go there, but I'm saying the more concrete it is, the more you can have somebody that can plan for that ahead of time, and the more you're putting the incentive to secure affordable housing in front of more process or more discretion. And that's just my thing is that's, you know, as we're going through these phases, I'd like to see that be the goal, right? That we're trying to secure housing because, you know, the, the options as prices go up, the options get less and less, and this is a good one. And so to do so, what can we do to really make sure that this can be a good mechanism to do that, right? So that's- I mean, site review is a discretionary process. Uh, it's not a you know ministerial level kind of review, but we are, again, trying to you know, work towards you know, a greater level of predictability in the projects and try to set out the city expectations a little bit more clearly in the code. Right. And I think that's, that's my, piece of this, which is the more incentives that we can clearly align, and this seems like a point to do it. I mean, we're, we're creeping towards something that will work, which I'm afraid just like a partial solution for a bike lane ends up just being a disaster. <laughs> and and I, so my goal is here would be to say same thing. I think it's a great start giving a, a community benefit, incentivizing, but I think that we need to probably make it, I would like to see it get made more robust. I actually think I was reading through the planning board, you know, kind of key points that they landed on at their meeting, and I agree with most of those. Um, the one that I don't, and I wanna align with Judy on this one, is the, um, 
the it wasn't senior housing. What was how was it? Mm -hmm. Assisted living. Assisted living or those. Um, you know that piece for me again. I think that's a pretty lucrative um, market um, from a business perspective. And so I think that if you're going to give some kind of a a break, it needs, as Judy said, to be attached to a a reasonable benefit to the community. Um, you know, extremely expensive affordable housing for or for seniors. Excuse me, extremely expensive housing for seniors doesn't provide a community benefit, um, and I think we need to we need to align that differently, as Judy was saying, so that we make sure we're getting an affordable. Just to push back a little bit, though, to be clear, I mean, we got a hundred units along with that uh, I pricey. I, 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 I could say you'd get those anyway because that's a good market, but. No, if we're talking about 311, which you're using as an example, correct? Mm -hmm. For expensive, um, you know, we got 104, 107. Yeah, offsite. So it wasn't. It wasn't. Ju but I'm just saying, just to curb it. It's not like they just threw up 311 and there wasn't anything attached to it. No, I agree. I just would disagree with the the actual. In other words, I think those units would have appeared regardless. But anyway. Another discussion. Okay. Um, my questions slash statements um, lie kind of in, let me pull it up real quick here. I had a question about the alternative, alternative community benefit part of this. Um, so how is that gonna be determined if someone does come, who, who's gonna decide that dollar amount that's gonna be replacing the inclusionary housing number? I mean, it's, they'd have to, it be on the applicant to demonstrate that whatever community benefit they're suggesting or proposing is equivalent to what is in the code. And then at the staff level, we would look at, at that analysis and see if we agree with it. And ultimately it would be determined, you know, by planning board, okay. uh, unless it's then called up to city council, then they would have to determine. Okay, I just want to make sure that everyone knows what the process is behind that because I think that is one area that it could get squirrely. Mm -hmm. um, when you're talking about being deliberative or deliberate about things. So um, I want to also agree with Jacques and Judy. Um, I'm worried about, again, luxury, senior or assisted living. Um, so I just want to throw that out there for our conversation. Um, and we've been talking a lot about the floor area ratio and um, Appendix J. Those are two things in my mind that should be set up for phase two. Um, but right now I do really wanna make a solid recommendation because we've gone a long time without making one. So if we can figure out exactly what we do agree on and at least meet there, that would be really, really nice so this board can really give something to council that they can chew on for once. Um, so yeah, I, I totally understand the problems with floor area, area ratio and that not being included in actual height. Um, but maybe that's for phase two, just so we can look closer at that. Um, and again, I like focusing on just Appendix J area right now because as Brian said, there is a sunset date, and that sunset date is gonna be decided by the next council whether or not they're gonna, again, push it forward or not. But um, the fact that we haven't had a whole bunch of public come out and say, hey, we really want this to be beyond Area J, and the fact that we haven't had a bunch of public come out and say, hey, we only want this to be uh, Appendix J, then that to me says status quo, what we have going on right now should be exactly what we do. That's it for me. Carl, thank you so much for explaining that because when I was reading the paperwork, my mind was going kind of numb. <laughs> so you, you put it into layman's terms very well, so thank you. Um, one of my questions, and I know there was discussion about residual land value in, um, in the consultant's report. How does land value factor in to all of this when you're talking about cash in lieu and what you're really able to get 
uh, from an inclusionary housing perspective, number of units and I mean, are you really is seven hundred and twelve thousand dollars or a million four really going to get you a lot in uh, from when you think about the land values? Because that's what what drives a lot of the expense in this town is land value. So that was one of my questions. Um, I don't know that I have the best answer for that. I think our economists would have a, a better answer. I think the res residual land value is basically um, what it would cost to, to pay for the property and that they have the, the money to um, do the project based on that. So it was the metric that they used in their assumptions to determine, you know, whether somebody would choose to do a project or not. But I don't know that I can speak to it much more than that. But it sounded like you had a more of a, a separate question about the cash in lieu and how much is actually generated and how much affordable housing gets produced. Did well, I get that correctly? Part of it is the land value because I know right. that that's what drives a lot of the expense and development in this town. Mm -hmm. And there's also economic factors. You know, what if we have an economic downturn and land values drop or development costs go up like they have so much in the last five years because of uh, tightening labor markets and tightening supply chains and things like that. So how does all that factor in? And then um, how are, are you really, with the cash in lieu dollars, able to get, extract the amount of affordable housing out of a project that's would be valuable to the city? Like what's the downside of, you know, this bonus? Does it really get us to a, a, a more affordable, uh, a, a larger number of affordable units? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, I think that's a great question. I mean, you can go to the slide showing the example projects. So, I mean, there's a pretty significant difference in the cash in lieu that the city would receive or the linkage fee amount. Um, so if you think about that additional 412,000, you know, that's probably an additional eight affordable units that the city could either acquire, um, you know, existing units and make them permanently affordable or new construction. Um, and then, the linkage one. That one jumped out at me even more. So you're, we're going from, well, an, yeah, an additional 900,000. So that's, you know, an additional 10 units. So it is pretty significant and it gives us money. And we've had this conversation before, right, with Kurt about how every dollar that the city brings in and, and cash in lieu that we're able to leverage that with state and federal funds. Um, you know, sometimes two to three times the amount that we put into it. So, um, you know, this is a great tool because it allows us to get deeper levels of, for, of affordability, um, you know, serving uh, different communities, special, you know, permanent supportive housing, different types. So, um, you know, I, I think from housing perspective, any additional revenue that we can get is gonna help us. Does that answer? Okay. Um, I, I just had, sorry, did, do you want to say something? I just yeah. want a clarification. They said 900,000 and yeah. mm -hmm. those numbers don't line up. Looks like 1.28. Oh, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Uh, 900,000 so, uh, plus 2.7 million is not 3.987. Yeah. I thought it looked odd too when I said that. Oh, it's even we'll go back and, and double check that. It actually might be the additional linkage fee beyond the standard linkage fee that would be applied to that square footage in your math. Say that again. So if you had the um, standard it's linkage 7, fee. 2.7, right? Right, but if you apply that to the third floor and then there's an additional percentage linkage fee, so you've got a double calculation there and I think you probably are only representing part of it. I see what you're saying, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this has been confusing for us too, so. Don't feel bad. We'll, we'll definitely go back <laughs> and check that. Um, one of the things I like about viewing community benefit through the lens of affordable housing is I think it gives us something that's permanent in our town versus other forms of community benefit. And I'm a little wary of those because I don't feel like we have a good way to hold developers accountable to the community, other kinds of community benefits that they promise one example is the movie theater that was promised in the Boulder Daily Camera building and that, that never happened. And who knows if that was even the right thing to put there in the first place. I mean, it was a great idea, but if, you know, economic feasibility, I don't know that community members are the best people to 
be able to give you the numbers on economic feasibility of a particular thing, but how do you hold developers accountable? If you've got an inclusionary housing project that gives you affordable housing, it's, it's permanent, we, right? So I like that as a priority um, over these other um, community benefits. And then I'm, I'm a, a believer in testing, you know, proof of concept. So I like the idea of sticking with Appendix J, testing it out, and seeing, seeing how we do in those areas and see if we can attract developers and make a, make a better case for the community to show examples of how it was successful before uh, just make, making it bl bl a blanket available. And if I haven't understood correctly that that's the alternative, is just to, to do away with the Appendix J, or that's the preferred or alternative opinion, um, then I misunderstood, but I like proof, the idea of proof of concept, because you build a case for support that way. Can I just make a clarifying comment on that? I think, um, so before the height moratorium, um, you could request a height modification pretty much anywhere in town. But when we were reviewing those, we didn't have a mechanism for saying um, what the benefit was. And actually, a good example is the uh, micro movie theaters in the Daily Camera uh, building, Pearl West. Um, we didn't have a criteria that allowed us to consider that as a part of our um, uh, consideration of the height. So we basically didn't. I mean, I think some people were emotionally pulled, and I thought it was super cool. But it wasn't that there was a community benefit, because there was no community benefit clause at the time, so we didn't use that as an equation the equation because it just didn't exist yet um there's a bit of a meme going around about that i think in terms of like so it's a false narrative it is yeah yeah it's it, you know and I, but i mean i was excited about it too so i you know and i was sad when it didn't happen but i wasn't thinking about it in terms of like making that make sense for it to be tall um the um so height modifications were available anywhere around town um, and, you know, my office has received height modifications for, um, like, a house when you build a deck on the downhill side, it moves the low point calculation, and the house then gets taller um, based on the, the math, right? And so you would ask for a height modification so that the deck can stick out on the downhill side away from the street. And in the city's eyes, because of the way we calculate things, it would, you know, that house has gotten 10 feet taller. But the house didn't get remodeled, it's just there's a deck on the back. So there's a lot of things that I think people don't really remember in terms of what height modifications are used for around town. Um, the city staff has done a good job of trying to bring those things under the umbrella, I think. Um, so then the height moratorium happened, and then you were only allowed to do it in these certain areas. Um, and so I think what makes sense to me is sort of framing in terms of like, you know, once was available everywhere, uh, there was a moratorium. Um, Appendix J was tied to the moratorium so we could only have height modifications in places where we were totally sure it was okay because there was already an uh, area plan or already a project approved. Then as we figured out how to tie height to community benefit, the idea was that the moratorium would, uh, Appendix J would go away and we would apply it back to the entire city. It's still a stiffening of the height modification rules from what, what, what it was four or five years ago. So it's actually still a, a real um, kind of reduction, I guess, in like, you know, what you can use to justify height modification requests. Um, so really the, the lifespan of the moratorium, of the Appendix J was supposed to be the lifespan of when we figured out community benefit. That, that was a promise that was made to the community. Terry. Mason. Um, since we're talking about um, Appendix J, uh, I think I've probably said it several times, but I'm always for a good, healthy public process, um, and I believe in good governance. So when we put in place moratoriums or sunset clause, um, it is to me supposed to be a pause in that moment to allow our city council to reflect or um, planning board and um, just like Brian was saying th that the agreement for the community was that it was a pause and to me good governance is um, that pauses occurred. Um, we set a date on it, it was the, tw uh, uh, you said May, right, 2020? It should be allowed to, um, go away, just like, you know, we've already uh, elongated, elongated it one other time, so 
Um, this is now the second time, and I think we're all very aware of the issues facing our city council right now about governance, and it's time to move forward with the process. Um, as far as incentivizing more affordability, um, I agree with you about catching that um, with the, um, I, I keep asking you to put it up because I, I can't remember the language on it, but the um, for the senior living, I find it interesting because we know we're in a housing crisis across the country and we are running out of land and the price is, is going up on everything. Um, but I find it interesting that we're willing and it's safe to say seniors when we know that seniors, at-risk youth, and transitional living are the three primary areas that we really need to take a, a look at. So it's, it's, I'm just gonna say that I think it's interesting that we think seniors are safe, but we're not willing to say the same thing for transitional living or uh, at-risk youth. So with that on record, um, this is way above my pay grade. Um, honestly, I'm gonna raise my hand and just say that. I'm always for a process that funnels up. So if we say, and I believe everybody at this table has, we're for affordable homes, then to me, the people whose pay grade it is um, need to help us figure out how do we do this in a way that's incentivizing it. and. Um, when we get into those weeds and the nuances and how it gets applied, that's a, it's, it begins to, to get above my pay grade. And um, I look towards and I ask people, you tell me, what is the, the I mean, and if I was sitting on council, I'd be saying the same thing. I am just a regular person reviewing this. I'd go to the architects, I'd go to the s staff that are planners, and I'd say, you tell me, how can we make something that incentivizes affordability and um, makes it easier for the developers to come in and create the things we keep saying we want, but we're not doing. Um, and that's my goal. So whatever that is while we're crafting, uh, I wanna incentivize affordability and I want to streamline this process uh, for our developers, and I know we've put a co bad connotation on the word developer, but I'm pretty sure I'm the only one, besides Jacques, maybe, that's built their own house. Maybe you, I don't know, I haven't talked to you about <laughs> Yeah, um, so I think, you know, developer comes in a lot of different forms, and without them, nothing would make it through our city's process. Um, so, I, uh, you know, again, that's where I sit on all of this. Yeah, Judy. I just have a question for both of you, Jay and Carl. Um, speaking just for myself, the only community benefit that's really important to me is affordable housing. And is there a way, I, I don't know how other people feel, but I wanted to have way more priority <laughs> over the other community benefits. And is there any way that if there's agreement on that uh, amongst HAB, we can... So you're getting into phase two right now, as far as my understanding goes. Yeah. And I think we want to, right now, we are just focused on affordable okay. housing and making this. Okay. Well, it is the priority. Is it, pardon? Is it phase two, though? Because when we talk about the height and the FAR on this, to me, we're talking about site review versus um, a process where it becomes streamlined. That is part of this first process, no? Am I wrong? Uh, the, yeah, the FAR and the density change is, is included in this ordinance. That's what I thought. Phase two is going to focus on other community benefits beyond right. permanently affordable housing. Uh, there might be some things related to permanently affordable housing that are included in that. Uh, and then again, the looking at the site review criteria uh, as part of phase two. I, I guess what I'm asking is will we get a chance, once we make these decisions, will we get a chance to chime in again when they're talking about alternate other community benefits, will we get a chance to chime in and go, wait, we want most of it to be permanently affordable? That'll be phase two, right? Okay. Can we pull up planning boards once again? And sure. um, because I think they've chunked it out. I know I keep saying that, but I don't have them. I'm like him, I'm erasing tapes after they're not um, <laughs> up there. Um, but I think what's interesting about this is that they've kind of pulled apart what you were talking about in your questions, correct? And it's you know something that we can look at as well. I find it fascinating. I just learned something new about the height thing. I didn't realize that that was affected by a deck. Um, and I also didn't realize that um, you know the it's not Bamoka, it's the art, the new Museum of Boulder. A museum of Boulder. Yeah, Museum of Boulder. Like, um, did they have to get a height modification for their deck up on top? 
Because that, or is that on their third story? Because that's a huge community benefit. I've known, like all my clients now, somebody's gone to a different event on that deck almost every other week. And I think that's, so I think when we talk about the modified height calculations and allowing access to roof decks and stuff, we keep talking about don't block our views. And I don't know about y'all, but the Rio deck has a fo very fond heart. You know, I'm spotting my heart. And so did um, the other deck on West End that's until it got blocked in. Yeah. Um, we can so, talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's what I'm saying is like, to me, those things matter. Okay, so as far as process goes here, my plan is to just essentially make uh, their two questions, if you could pull those up, please, into our recommendation and then make friendly amendments to it there. So does HAB support new site review criteria? It would just be like, HAB recommends the new site criteria that would require permanently affordable. So it's the exact same thing you're reading there, except HAB recommends instead of does HAB support. Is that about right, Jay? Would that do it? Um, well, we have an actual motion language for you. Oh, do you? Be easier oh, even better. From Because those were really the questions to tee up the, yes. excuse me, the conversation. Um, for the critical issues. I'm just seeing but we might need to break out yeah. the J part from yes. the main part. <coughs> yeah. Maybe see if in general we're, we're leaning towards agreeing with Scott. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, we'll do some straw yeah, polls here. We want to see if we're generally agreeing with staff, or I'm not to generalize, but agreeing with planning board, because planning board didn't agree with staff. Right. <laughs> I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to draw the line there, but it seems well, like that's the easiest way to define it. <laughs> a very minimized planning board didn't yeah, agree with. I understand. That. Well, there's well, only four. So. Well, you know, one person, and that meant the whole. Thing. Right. Totally. That's what I mean. It's yeah. it's not a full representation. So, Adam, can I go over what you were suggesting just to make sure yep. that you're suggesting somebody move to that and mm -hmm. I'd be happy to so move. And then right away, people can make friendly amendments if they want to add with the exception of blah, 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 blah. And then we vote on each of those friendly amendments and then we then vote on the main piece. Yeah. Pardon? No. No. Do a, the, the primary motion happens and there's a second and then friendly motions happen and they're either accepted or denied by the right. motion makers. Right. right. And then, but they're not voted on. Um, and then the, uh, if they're denied by the primary motion maker and the seconder, then they can be offered again as a, as a motion to the board and then they're voted on. So it goes from being a friendly amendment to be a sort of an unfriendly amendment. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. yeah cool. I, I guess my concern with Yes. This recommendation is from a procedural standpoint. If we go back, this is an amalgam of those two questions and all the uh, all the other issues that are wrapped right. into Yes. That. Right. And I like answering the two questions because I think those are two different things. Because if I'm looking at this, yeah. you know, again, we're looking at enhanced community benefit. Is that specific to affordable housing or not? That would be one of my questions. And again, is it predicated on having to be Appendix J, yes or no? And then the other question with Appendix J because, um, I think you guys both brought up, and I think it's probably a decent compromise, is if we're gonna extend the sunset, then we should extend it just for a trial basis if we do. Didn't but I, I, two, tri two trials? Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. the thing, right? You know, so just saying, okay, you know, we're just, you know, shrugging off the sunset. There's, so there's a lot of nuance there. Before we get to here, I think those two questions are the fundamental thing that we need to really wrestle with. And that's because that's what I wanna make the recommendations yeah. based on. Right those two questions rather than this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. agreed. Two questions. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me like it could be this motion, but then at the end of it, it could be like accepting that and then have a list of what <laughs> yeah, right. different, um, like. It might be three slides. <laughs> <to> <laughs> Appendix J or. So does it seem like it's everyone agrees that we want to do question one and then do question two? Yeah. And so. And then we can amend this based on that. Okay. Discussion. Okay. So let's go back to the questions. Perfect. And let's just do straw polls real quick. Um, as stated, do, do people like this? So would they accept this as stated currently? As long as we can do friendly amendments, right? Oh, well, no, you have to make the friendly amendment. Okay, well then, I'm, I thought what you would make you like the to amend? First, I thought you have to make Sure, I'll, I'll make the motion that we would accept the language in number one. Great, and I'll be happy to second it. 
But I have a friendly amendment. Yeah, or, so this is a straw poll, or are you just I don't know. that and you're going right into a motion? Because I'm not here. So, yeah. Yep. Are we straw polling or are we not? You you're, you're right. We should straw poll first and then work on amendments off of that. Yes. So let's straw poll. Okay. Who would accept the language as is? <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> what are the amendments people would like? So, so just, yeah. From the lawyer brain, if we're going to talk about Appendix J and number two, it shouldn't be referenced in number one. That's to start with. Secondly, I want the emphasis on permanently affordable housing benefits, which is significantly different from enhanced community benefit, which is stated in the motion. So I would right. emphasize that. Uh, and then uh, third, um, you know, uh, I would like to just have something in there that, that just says would require for, you know, I like everything that's in there and say, and uh, create a process that um, uh, streamlines or somehow, you know, you know, provides upfront mechanisms and incentives uh, to throw the affordable housing right at the front, like we said, so that, you know, people that are better oriented to do so are going to be the people that are buying the land and designing the project right from the get-go. I don't know how we say and that. And I think we could strap, after that, we could strap hold the J. Yeah. Yes. Qu question. Right. They're separate. Is, is our job tonight to, to come up with all the thoughts and ideas or just to agree or not agree with this? Because the thoughts and ideas can go on for days. Right. <laughs> it's it's yeah. trying to find what we can agree upon enough yeah. that we'd want to pass it does, on does, to the council. Because to me, the, I mean, strictly speaking, the decision is do we support this? So if we say no, then we say no and we move on. But or is it no and what would make us support this? What are you guys looking for? Yeah, there's no, that's what they want. <laughs> yeah. There's no with caveats, question. no or yes. I mean, I think what would be the most helpful is if there is general support on the board for the ordinance, then it would be a recommendation of approval, but listing what the recommended changes should be to the council. But if there was general agreement among the board that this is not something that should move forward, then it would be, you know, recommended that it not be approved. Because what so I'm worried about is not right. coming up with like, you know, 30 things that yeah. we could add onto this and we're debating all 30 things and, you know. I understand where you're coming from. <laughs> That's a really good point. I mean, I, if I, I'm supportive of what's there if we take out the reference to Appendix J so we can answer it in question two. So my feeling um, is that if we take out Appendix J on number one, um, I still will want to add one amendment, but I would like to do number two first because if, say, everyone votes that we support it and Amendment J is taken out and then the vote goes um, that everybody wants to have it go all broad across the city, that would change my vote on the first one and I wouldn't vote for it. So I'd like to get the Appendix J again first. Yeah, okay, strap pull J. Um, I'm in favor of just J. So wait, 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 be clear, be clear, <laughs> okay. be clear what we're saying. Maintaining just J. Maintain, so you're saying continue yes. past 2020. Not past 2020. Okay, so see, just this is Just currently in the moment, not with the new ordinance. Got it. Right so now. it's not, you're not asking for I'm not asking to extend it right now. I'm just, just saying. until 2020. At least, yes. So just to clarify. And council saying. can decide if they want to continue another. Allow it to sunset yeah. and they can, they yes. decide. So right. what that means is the only place you can ask for height variances is in Appendix J. Until? Until the sun sets. May of 2020. Right. But in, the, in the vacuum of that, sure. that's what we're talking about. So the two and a half month period <laughs> between when the ordinance is adopted and, I know, and when the sunset is. I mean, from a practical perspective, what projects are coming through any of these Appendix J areas that are gonna be, there's just not. Yeah, let me, <laughs> actually I was gonna ask for just like a, um, a moment here to review Appendix J with you guys to make yeah. sure it's really clear what's in there and not in there. So do you guys have a graphic for that in the, in the slideshow? So the top one up in North Boulder is the armory site. So that'll be taken out of Appendix J because it's being built. The little one. Yeah, the highest one on the left side um, on North Broadway. So that one goes away, so that doesn't exist anymore. Um, Boulder Junction um, is sort of a moot point because it's already been uh, handled through, it's mostly built uh, TVAP phase one or Boulder Junction phase one is, is permitted on its way under, into the ground right now. 
um, phase two is already um, land use planned, so it's already kind of taken out of this map as well. Uh, Riverbend campus, we had uh, included that one in to allow the hospital to build the building that's already built there now. So that one mostly doesn't make any difference anymore. Fraser Meadows is built, so that one's taken out. Um, and so the only parts that are left in Appendix J are downtown, which is pretty much built out, um, the mall, 20th Street Mall, and the hill. So we're saying that if you maintain Appendix J, there are exactly three places in town. And I get that. Where you can. I'm just making sure that everyone gets yeah. it. And my problem is, next two years are very low. or zero, yeah. <laughs> my problem is why open it all up right now without that robust public process that never happened? Well, the, because the robust public process informed the original rules yes, that were the site review criteria. This had no process. Right. So the, the, you're voting to maintain the thing that has no process yeah, until 2020. Yeah. But you're, you're saying that whoever put this in place has the right to put something in place without process. Do you see what you're asking yeah. to have extended? Council does have that right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. But we don't well, I guess I'm just saying it's it's uh, inconsistent to say that you would maintain this map in in the face of having public process because sure, it, this it's map just maintaining it until 2020. Yeah, I'm, I'm not arguing with you about what you want to do. I'm just simply saying that just factually, this map only includes downtown. Uh, the mall and the hill. I get it. And yep. it was drawn without any public process so at all. Call for the question of going back to the straw poll, please. Yep. So we're straw polling whether we maintain Appendix J through 2020, only not asking for an extension. And that would be me. Versus, like that. versus open it up completely. I want to clarify that that's yeah. what we're doing. Is yeah. that what we're doing with Appendix J? Just we're just poll. saying. Yeah, the chrome. Throw it out right now or? Keep it as it is. Or remove it. Because I mean, it's remove. sunsetting around the corner, right? And so. I mean, another option could be like, keep it as it is until a different date. So there's kind of three options, but I don't want to complicate the discussion. <laughs> well, we could also talk about other areas, but we have no expertise on what those areas should be, so. Because I think if we're, I, I guess the reason why I'm asking this, if we're talking about just letting it sunset as it's intended to right now, then we're probably going to get consensus from everybody. Sure, that's it's five months, yeah. six months, or something, <laughs> right? So, cool. I mean, I'm for that, right? We don't need to change it right now. We don't even have an ordinance yet. But if we're talking about extending it or keeping that limit, that's just going question. with what's on the board right now. Yeah. Well, it's, it's yeah. And I just want to add, just so you understand that council may do otherwise completely. Sure. But yeah. Well understood. We're advisory board. But <laughs> yeah, please. So I think the one thing for me about just removing Appendix J entirely at this point is because, as we've noted, it's essentially moot. It wasn't put together with decent process. And I think the statement that we're saying, if we say, okay, attach it to Appendix J until May of 2020 or until it sunsets, then if there is an extension on Appendix J, then we're saying, oh, well, that's okay. And what we're essentially saying is there's nowhere to do this, basically, right. in town. Right. So it's, it's absolutely, in my mind, irrational to include Appendix J as a piece of this. Right. Right. It's I, only a way to shut it down. I, I think if the question is, let it sunset or don't let it sunset, then we deliver a much clearer message both to the council and in terms of where we stand, right? Sure. Right. My point would be if we say we agree with this, but we don't think it should be limited to Appendix J, right. then we're saying we agree with this thing and we want to see some affordable housing. It's based on your trust in council, I guess. Well, I think it's beyond. it's a little beyond that. It's a little beyond that. It's saying that right wherever council goes with this down the road they're going to go with it yeah but and and that's what they're going to do but we're sending a message for us sending a message about trying to accomplish a community benefit tied to this particular um relief yep then tying it to this uh, i think is is not a rational so thing. i'd like to add that although 
people have differing opinions of if there was a public process, how this was set up, whatever. Since this community benefit plan has been formed, it was restricted just to Appendix J for the time being, and so the public's expectation is that City Council can choose to have more public hearings on that and do whatever. Right now it is the way it is, and I think it should stay that way until, it, until Council decides what to do about it. So I'm I, I hate to keep jumping in on you guys, but just factually having been in the room when we started this community benefit project, Appendix J was only meant to last during, uh, to give us enough time to figure out what we're deciding on tonight, um, and was meant to sunset at that time. It wasn't meant to be the laboratory for figuring this out. It was meant to be a way of keeping height modifications from happening throughout the city, except in places where we're comfortable with them while we figured this out. So but the somehow, promise, but the somehow it's in the plan. Made. It's in the plan that's been published for the public. Yeah, as something that's supposed to sunset in March right. 20. So let's just leave that as it is. Yeah, I mean that's that, that's what I'm advocating for is leaving it, letting it sunset. Yeah. But I'm not really um, trying to play a role in that. I'm sort of like making sure that I'm kind of offering whatever kind of historical knowledge I have available to me based on you know having been there. Okay. So the straw poll would have two options. Yep. Which are which two options? The option is to keep it just till the sunset, not asking for any additional or to remove it right now within our recommendation, yeah. It's five months, guys. <laughs> okay. And I'm a sunsetter, so. It's a message. Sunsetter. Sunsetter. Sunset, yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> yeah, I'm for the message. Okay. And, okay, so we have four and three, which doesn't make for a very solid recommendation, but we'll, we'll move well, on. A po straw poll, so yeah, no, right. no, so, you, so, we haven't voted. And I guess my question is, if we ask the question, uh, does it need to expand after the sunset or not, then we're delivering a more clear message. And so I guess- So yeah, should we say, point. as a board, with the recommendation not to extend beyond sunset? Right. Because I might be more on board with that, to be honest with you. To what? To say, and don't extend this beyond the sunset. Right. No I'm not, I mean, again, my message is we're in a housing crisis. We need to start applying these things now. And um, we just heard from the original person who said that this was put in place so that we could figure this stuff out and we're making, we're figuring it out right now and we're putting it in place with our recommendations so there's no need for it to continue to be in place. Okay. With respect to, ex right. with it, respect it, to Exhibit it's J. It's like me saying that I, I, I needed to put an awning up for a second while I built my garden. I don't <laughs> I keep the awning up the we whole time it. after yeah. my garden. Yes, um, I'd like to move that we, that we accept the current status of Exhibit J with the sunset period in Mar Mar May 2020, but not any farther. I'd like, to see the, I'd like to see the. Can we second question that motion? We I second. second that motion. Great. Can we get a little discussion? Discussion. That I'm in support of because I think. <laughs> okay, okay, so good. Corey needs that clear before you get yep. to Sorry. Just say it again, Terry. Okay, I hope I can do that. Um, <laughs> I'd like to move that we support the current status of Exhibit J. Appendix. With the understanding that it doesn't extend past May 2020, which is the current sunset date. Right. Okay, okay, now discussion, and please one at a time. Judy. Okay, I would only be in favor of that if it was added, if you'd be willing to add to that um, with a robust public process. I, I don't know what that means, but. Uh, that means <laughs> that means that city council doesn't just that means decide that on. 500 a emails or 200 emails or three <laughs> public hearings, or what does that mean, I don't know. <laughs> Then I couldn't support it. Hey, Judy, can I, what we talked about on planning board, this might help inform what you're, I think, trying to get at, is that we felt like if there was gonna be a further discussion of where uh, increases in height could be around, happen around the city, that that should be tied to a robust community process. Is that what you're trying to head towards? Yes. Cool, thanks. That might help a little bit in the way of. So you have any problems with that no. friendly amendment? And Corey, do you I'd still it? second wonderful with that addition. I like it. Do you want to read it, read it back? 
Yeah, let's hear what we have right now. <laughs> right, this is what happens when everybody's like, blah, 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 blah. Yes, it is. Do you, and Corey, do you still have the process of putting that up on the screen so people can see it in written form still? I don't know where, you're, where we're at with that. Okay, got it. Sorry, That's all right. I, I've been working on it. Mm -hmm. um, and the full motion language. So maybe you could just vote on it all together. Assuming you can come to agreement on these points. Let's start with the one I think. Well, yeah, let's start with the ones on the, on the table. So what I have here is Palmos motion to support the current status of Appendix J with the understanding that it doesn't extend past May 2020. Nog motion to amend Palmos's motion and add a robust public process. Um, Teodoro seconded. Okay, so technically that amendment is what we're talking about right now. Right. The public process amendment? The public process yeah. amendment. Okay. Can I ask a clarifying question just as somebody who's going to be... <laughs> well, actually, I won't be here anymore by this time. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> but I think, Judy, what you're saying is, if, is different from what's in the second language Green. there, which is that if there is a further discussion about height modifications in the city, that that should be the part of the result of a robust community engagement process. Is that that's correct? So, yes. Corey, I'd probably try to get that because really we're not saying that the sunset has to have a public have process. a public robust right. process because we don't have time for Which that. Now we're things. saying it's going to sunset, and then mm -hmm. further discussion would be right. the result of or would include a robust community engagement process. I think your amendment might be better served when we discuss number one. Meaning the robust public process coming into play with what community benefit is, how it's tied to affordable housing, how it's tied to height exemptions, versus just sunsetting Exhibit J in five months. Except then I won't, then I, if we want to get consensus, I won't vote for, for it without that, with this one without that in it right there. Okay, but is the, uh, my question along your lines, Brian, is, is, the, is the public process dealing with sunsetting Exhibit J, or is the public process dealing with the bigger picture here? Bigger picture. Okay, so that's, it's going to be both. That part needs to fit with both. One and two. Okay. Because I, I see two public processes. One public process dealing with the bigger picture, and one public process is, do we want Exhibit J to keep going? Well, you would want that language in both. Mm -hmm. As to whether or not we want Exhibit J to keep going, or what? A process regarding where we want to I'm apply happy, restrictions. Happy to let it sunset, if any changes to the height modifications is the result of a robust public process, and I do want it in both, or I can't support. Okay, well that's voting for it. Can I ask a question? Yes. If there were to be changes to the height, the areas were, or I mean, the default is. J sunsets, and then we go to the existing height allowances under the existing zoning, correct? So any changes from that would require a robust public process to change zoning. Just naturally. Cool, so what would be wrong with current, putting it in there then? It's the current process. It's our current code, yeah. Well, I just think it confuses, as we are seeing right now, what <laughs> we're talking about exactly. Well, we just know she's not going to support the language without it. So we'll just keep discussion. Okay. So are we okay with that friendly amendment? And we're going to vote on that if we're done with discussion. I, I would want to hear, if I were you, how it was re sure. yeah. before yeah. I said yeah. that. Yeah, we want to hear the full. Again? With, with, sorry, we want to hear Judy's friendly amendment. To amend to include a robust public process. That was all I wrote. So the, uh, I didn't go into detail about what that meant. Yeah. Just that I said a robust public process, unless you want to clarify or add additional language. I'll be happy to include The suggest. suggestion I was making was simply that what, because that ties together the sunset of Appendix J with a robust process, which is not Judy's intent. What it needs to say is that um, future discussions around height modifications in the city of Boulder need to include a robust community engagement process. 
Is that okay? I hate That's trying to put words in your mouth. I'm just trying to like that. Well, and what it, it, what we're saying is redundant because we already have that in our process. Right. It's already there. If whenever we go about changing anything in height or zoning or planning, it goes into a robot, so it's just redundant. It is redundant, but she's not going to go without it. So I get it. I get it. I'm just, you know, it's so to what, if you send it to council and we're worried about how we look, it's just something to be aware of. Yeah, you can play me. <laughs> well, you so do you want me to just add yeah. to amend to include a robust public process on future discussion around height modifications? Yeah. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Only if the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> well, East of what? <laughs> Lawyer. All right, now, now. And my only cautionary when we get wordy like this is that we got chastised for this. I know. In, it, by council that we get too too wordy and yeah. too, that we need to learn how to condense and edit ourselves down. So I'm just suggesting that this might be one of those moments instead of redundancy. Clarity. Clarity. Okay. So now we're at a vote for the friendly amendment. Unless anyone has any other discussion on it. Okay, those in favor of adopting the friendly amendment? You don't actually vote on adopting a friendly amendment, you just... You well, we do here, Brian. Okay, <laughs> sorry, that's, that's fine. We were on our own rodeo up in this place. Different Robert's rules, I guess. Okay, it is, it's remove the friendly amendment. Bob's rules. Not approved. Yes, now that we're going to, yes, I know Terry, thank you. <laughs> okay. It's on the table, so let's go for the vote unless there's any other discussion around the language. Well, now I can say that I, the last part of the sentence is what I can't support. If that's uh, eliminated, I can't support the current status of Appendix J with the understanding it does not extend beyond May 20th, and then leave it there and let City Council decide what to do about it. I can support that. It's short. Yes, <laughs> clarity. <laughs> Love it, right. clarity. And who's the person who made, has to agree to that? Was it you who started it? Wonderful, I think it sounds great. It's perfect, okay. Well, let's just go straight to the vote then on this one. All those in favor of this language? Cool. Now let's get into the unanimous, hard one. Corey. Yep, unanimous. Well, which one are you? <laughs> <laughs> Number two. What you have on the screen there. S uh, support the current status of Appendix J with the understanding it does not extend beyond May 2020. Beautiful words are all approved. There we go. Cool. Now the, the hard one. Uh, where did one come in? Why is that written there? So I was just trying to draft some notes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So you would have something to react to. Can you, can you go back? <laughs> Poke in the bear, Jay? Can you go back to question number one? Yeah. Yeah. We gotta plug it in. And I don't wanna go down the rabbit hole of trying to put in every single little thing into this, obviously, but so let's try to discuss only the big ones that we heard. Um, well, yeah, let's, I, let's. I think we strike the reference to Exhibit J in mm -hmm. question one. Okay. Or we can s switch some of the PowerPoints back up again. And I like the cat. So my thought is, <laughs> with simplicity, could we just say the Housing Advisory Board recommends um, the new site review criteria um, for community benefits, and then we can then add in friendly amendments with the exception of, and if anyone adds them, and if they don't, that's it. Yep, and just go down the list one by one mm -hmm. with quick votes. So I will, I will so move that first part, that the Housing Advisory Board recommends um, staff's new site review criteria for community benefit. For currently affordable housing benefits. For current affordable housing benefits, right. That's, Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And did you want, do we Can want we to strike the J or not strike no. the J? Strike. 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 Right. Okay. Did you get that? Kind of. Right. So this one's much wordier. 
from the memo. So the Housing Advisory Board recommends that City Council adopt the Community Benefit Ordinance, Attachment A, referencing the memo, amending the Land Use Code to establish a new Community Benefits Program specific to permanently affordable housing. So I added that part. And then um, that would amend Title IX Land Use Code, building height regulations for certain areas of the city. We could remove that part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can remove everything after housing. Yeah, I think that would be, I'm fine with that too. Does that sound good to folks? Yes. I just I want to yeah. see a few more head nods. After, after regulations, right? After building height regulations of the city. So after city, sorry. Reading less and less. But it also amends something else. So I think we should either, I mean, we've left something out. I mean, we, aren't we basically agreeing with what the staff set out and then we'll put with the exceptions of. So I don't know if we have to say any of that after affordable housing. Okay, so that is your next sentence. The Housing Advisory Board further recommends the following changes to the staff recommendation. Yeah, so do and I need somebody to second me first, that motion? Yeah, we need to, we need to put the motion on the table. Okay, so, so moved. And I'll second. I'd like to add a friendly amendment that says nursing home and assisted living facilities will be exempt only, and you're gonna have to help with this, Jay, probably, and Carl, only if they meet um, some permanently affordable housing criteria. And I don't know how you wanna say that. I think the easier way to do it is just not to exempt them. Yep, I would strongly support that. Okay, all right, all right. I move that we not exempt nursing homes and assisted living units. How's my language up there? Fine by me? Yeah. Does that capture it, Judy? Mm -hmm. Okay, I would second that friendly amendment. Any discussion? I mean, I, I don't know if I have anything. It just goes down to, I think we just, what we're doing by saying to not include nursing homes and assisted living is we're funneling down to what we don't want and we're not opening up to what we do want. Um, this this doesn't get more inclusive, this gets more exclusive. So I'm hesitant because it's just excluding. I understand what we're trying to do, it's just exclusionary language. Instead of what we've put up there, how about we figure out some inclusionary, inclusionary. language, which okay. would, Funnel I'm up. just gonna start thinking here, but that would say, we also recommend that um, city council develop criteria. And what are we trying to hit here to kind of <laughs> hit these, these pieces? Really that are that would cover the nursing homes, cover <laughs> the transition, <laughs> cover those those bits. Is there something that we can? So how about saying, Jack, is, is we don't want to give uh, the exemptions for really nice senior housing, <laughs> or really expensive senior housing, really not expensive, nice. right. expensive, not nice. So do well, not include nursing homes and assisted living as exemption unless. Um, well, that's not what I'm. That's not yeah, what I'm trying, trying to get to at. We're trying to get rid of the what do I'm not get at and go to inclusion. There are other areas. Oh, okay. It would be valuable for us to add to, in other words, to roll into this community benefit piece. We were we were saying just nursing homes and assisted living. I say nursing homes and assisted living are fine, but can we base it instead of on that specific, you know, designation? Can we base it on other other? housing that we value. So I have a question words, then. Just, mm -hmm. Someplace on there, on what your presentation, you included a few areas like public service, fire departments, blah, 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 blah. Can you add specific wording that will cover 
what Mason and Jack were talking about, like transitional housing, mm -hmm. and uh, and that they could be totally exempted because they obviously, by nature of what they do, you don't get a high end transitional housing, right? Do you? Exactly. No. <laughs> exactly. So can those words be added to that part, and can we say that here? You mean like change the alternative community benefit to include some other uses beyond just police, fire? Yeah, that wasn't. Those were an alternative community benefit. I thought those were just in a, a different part. I mean, that's not like um, the arts and cinemas and whatever. It was a separate section you had about fire departments and. Yeah, that that was just a, a catch-all for something that wasn't permanently affordable housing that might be a a a large community benefit that could be done at this time. Right, so could you add the things that Mason and Jacques were like transition? Them social, uh, you called them something. Yeah. Is there a we definition were, in the code for group home? Mm -hmm. You were talking about is them. Is it broad or is it? So, so part of the challenge is nursing homes and assisted living are technically commercial uses. Um, that's why they're treated differently than say, permanently supportive housing. Plus, if it's permanently supportive housing, it's already going to be permanently affordable, typically. So a so permanently a just, senior facility is not? I'm sorry? A senior facility is not a... It's not considered residential, no. Oh. Um, but can I make a process suggestion? Yes. So um, it's going to be really difficult for you to try to um, amend the ordinance and all the t details that go along with that. I would suggest that you talk about the things you don't want to see move forward in the ordinance. And then what I put up here is furthermore, the Housing Advisory Boards recommends that in phase two of the community benefit project, okay. these issues be considered. Great. Mm -hmm. I, like, I that. like that structure. Thanks. So the alternative community be the benefit language just talks about city facilities and, and it does list human services. Human services, that's what yeah. you called it. Great. So we leave this as is, do not include nursing homes and assisted living as an exemption. Mm -hmm. That's what's on the table right now. I would say unless demonstrably affordable, right? But there's no. Because I wouldn't want to subjective rule that out. It's subjective. It's different though. from the other group homes. If they're already permanently affordable, then they're going to get the benefit. Yeah. So there are permanently affordable Juliet projects in Boulder. There are. That, yeah, there are, and it's a, it can be rentals or for sale. Mm -hmm. um, if you're doing assisted living. That is what triggers you into the uh, different code categories. So it's not really senior housing, it's more the, the provision of services on site that moves you into that category. So uh, if you were to do a senior focused affordable housing project, it would fit under the cover of essentially any affordable housing project. Yeah. Yep. That makes sense. That's helpful. My, so my you could exempt the whole thing. Juliet? Yeah. Yeah. My Sorry, comment is in. just that I see nursing homes and assisted living as healthcare facilities and not housing. And we probably need healthcare facilities for aging populations and others in this community. So I-, I We all agree with that. Our, I know that I wouldn't exempt it. Our complaint is that we don't want a luxury assisted living home or nursing home to get this benefit. Have you been in an assisted living home? Because <laughs> I have uh, recently- <laughs> I don't think of that as assisted living. I think of that as senior housing, luxury senior housing. And I guess when I think assisted living, I think of a healthcare facility that has skilled nursing, uh, some component of skilled nursing. Frazier Meadows is a good example. Yeah. 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 So just not get into a point where we're funneling down and exempting things for the one who might abuse it is what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, so right. let's not exempt for the one that it abuse it when we're. Okay, well, we can vote on this. And, yeah. and I'd like to read an article um, I read that was put out in July 2019 from a place called Equity Multiple that says why, uh, that talked about in the past several years, these are about people who invest, for people who invest, and it says senior living facilities have emerged as a high-performing commercial real estate asset with over $250 billion in assets. And, um, and I think the if these uh, if they're n if we leave it as it is, these places can still apply if they want to provide services j um, for permanently that for people who can't afford. Otherwise, they are going to be just luxury facilities. And um, y you know, so I, I'm for keeping it in. Well, 
Well, I think that... Because they raise everyone's rents. I think, am I mistaken that if, if we do not include specifically this piece about nursing homes and assisted living, if those facilities that are proposed provide a certain amount of affordable units. It's not residential, though. That's what you're saying. So that's yeah, the mess. If it yeah. wasn't included as a community benefit, the, the, the change would basically be that if a four or five story nursing home or assisted living facility came in, they would have to pay that 43% higher commercial linkage fee for that fourth and fifth floor. That would be the difference. So what it means, though, is that without exempting them, that means that a nursing home or assisted living facility could start and not have to pay anything and say, we're not taking Medicaid. We just don't take Medicaid at our facility. They can say that. Places right. say that all the time. And, and if you really want to ensure that the people who can least afford to get nursing home and assisted living care, then you don't want to give them an exemption because if they do, they'll, they'll make it. If, if they do attend to that population, they'll, they'll be able to make it. Yeah, so just one little thing on that. In the beginning, you said not pay anything. Since they're commercial buildings, they would actually be paying the commercial linkage, linkage fee, fee. Yeah. and they'd be paying the bonus linkage fee above the thing, so they actually just do pay something. The so it's just a question of that bonus, bonus linkage fee for four, four and five that we're talking about. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Which is 900000 to $1.2 <laughs> <million>, whatever <laughs> it is, there. but yeah. it's... And, and I, what we're trying to say is, if they if they get that benefit, is this confirming that they're getting that benefit in return for somehow affordable units within there? I mean, some some benefit to the community. In other words, let, let me yes. If it's, to answer that question, the the, the super nice uh, senior housing group comes to town asks for a fourth and fifth floor, they get it, they pay more linkage fee, that's more money that goes into the affordable housing fund that then is used to go build more affordable housing properties. Yep. And remember- Oh, that's, 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 that's what that's it probably. is. And these, <laughs> these are beds, not units. These are not- No, this, this, is, not this is commercial. This is commercial. 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 So it's a linkage that's what per I mean. square foot. I, th I mean, these nursing homes and assisted living, people don't- don't live there. I mean, they may live there as their home, but these are beds right. they're having. It's yes. not. It's not their house. Well, actually, yeah, just just the ones like Fraser Meadows, there are different permutations of that. They're not typically single room occupancy, mm -hmm. uh, like a like a hospital. They're typically apartment mm -hmm. style living is what most of them actually are. Um, and so, you know, Fraser Meadows, for example, which is part of what was carved out in Appendix J, um, has a variety of housing types, and none of them are single room occupancy. Um, there's a separate issue, which is you, you brought up of like uh, taking or not taking Medicare. That's a really interesting one, sort of a separate topic. Okay. And um, sorry, they, uh, another piece of this, just to add a bit of color from the planning board conversation that hasn't shown up here yet. Um, we've heard a lot uh, from people over the years, and this is, I think, why this came in originally to the um, uh, to the staff's recommendation, um, saying, you know, older folks in town saying, you know. I'm, I'm an empty nester, I'm um, living in my uh, the house I raised my kids in, it's way too big, I don't need it anymore, but I have nowhere to go. And so I th that's what we've heard a bunch that's made us think like, oh, there's a, there's a built-in housing need in the community, which is where people who have lived here for a long time need a place to stay here. And when they get to stay here in a, in a home, in a, either it's assisted living or it's, uh, you know, a Presbyterian Tower or it's, you know, Fraser Meadows or whatever it is, like, you know, uh, you have a variety of housing options, right? Um, then that frees up the house that was um, occupied to become a family home. So we've kind of found a, a nexus between providing senior housing and freeing up single family homes. Yeah, but I'm interested, you know, I'm interested in helping places like Golden West. I'm not interested in helping places like the Academy. They don't need our help. And so I think if you just uh, don't include that exemption, it covers it. So the real question on the table here is, do we want the money from the fourth and fifth story in nursing homes, or do we not? The additional money. The additional money. Because we still get Correct. money. Yeah, we absolutely we get, get, we get commercial floor. linkage fee money, absolutely. Correct. So what do you guys think? I want the additional money, because it's a business. 
Yes, Chief. We, oh, I'm just, okay. I thought we were voting. Okay. We're not voting, I'm just. Okay. Oh, I left it. Yeah. You're just additional money or not, just gonna go down the line? I'm chewing on it. Okay, Judy, you like, like, I like the you like the additional money, Jacques? I'm chewing on it still. Yeah, right. Julianne? I'm just worried that uh, we would discourage those kinds of facilities from getting developed and being available for people who need them. The fourth and fifth story we would, because everything else is the same. same. Uh, to me, this whole discussion, whether it's senior housing or whatever building it is, is all a trade-off between additional height and, and maybe more affordable housing and for me, I think there's other ways to get more affordable housing other than additional height. Blanket. Because personally, I go around the Exhibit J sites in the last 10 years where all these fourth and fifth stories were built, and I don't think any of them were needed at all to have a fourth or fifth story. I think you could have done the same thing in less, and it would be better for everything. I think you can still get more affordable housing and more money for affordable housing and more linkage fees and all that stuff without going up. Again, I'm always for housing. Um, so to me, um, if it means going up um, and we get more units and we keep our people here and we keep them off the road and we don't displace our seniors, I am for um, doing whatever I can to incentivize that. So I am um, for them allowing to stay in this as exempt. I don't need to bilk more money out of it. I get that we're afraid of the 311, but um, I, I will always build positively towards it then down. And I'm, I'm in favor of the exemption too, just hearing all this. I mean, I think we're still getting money from it. And it's just that, you know, additional delta and but you know, it's 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 a business, but it's a functional business, and I yeah. think that's the point with it. So, I'm for the exemption. I'll flip. <laughs> and I'll, I'll stick with it. Cool. Um, okay. Well, let's uh, vote on it then. <laughs> so, all those for the exemption. Yep. All those for the exemption. Uh, could you repeat? So, all those not for that. Two. To do not. <laughs> Yes, you'd, you'd bring it back to the original. Yeah, yeah. so, all, okay, let's just call it, call it like this. Let's say, all those for number two. As it's written? As it's written. Okay. All those against number two. Okay, motion is defeated two to, or five to two. Five to yep. yeah. Is it safe to say that the little discussion, well, the long discussion we just had about how uh, um, <laughs> nursing homes, can apply to all buildings with this height exemption versus more money? Is that safe to say that? No. Is that how we feel? No, no, I'm, I'm saying is that how we feel? Or is it just to nursing homes? Because it seems to me like we just had a discussion saying we like, we're willing to give height for more money in nursing homes, right? I think, although there's lots of confusion into my thoughts sometimes. <laughs> um, but my feeling is that because the nursing homes are not residential, um, and there's no easy linkage to requiring permanent affordability either on site, it's a different, it's a it's a bit of a different category. Oh yeah, no for right? sure. So that's- Conceptually though. Yeah. yeah. Conceptually um, more height, more money, more affordable. Yeah. It's just not Conceptually, on site. I mean, yeah. You know. So do we have any other things that we need to add to this before we vote on the main one? Are you talking about voting on everything but the bottom line for the more the housing board recommends? We're talking about voting on the main line, okay. the top paragraph. Do we need to include any other exemptions is my question. Yes, we're right. And I do not have any. I can't think of any. Mason, any? Nope. Okay. So let, let's vote on the motion, the original motion. Why did you highlight that piece? It's, if your goal is to be um, succinct, I don't think you need it. Okay. 
I'm good with that. So I understand we're, we're voting more or less to support staff's position, not planning board's position. Correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we, we, did, we didn't take a position on this. <laughs> what wasn't this the whole point? No, on the right. uh, um, senior. No, not senior. We're past senior housing now. Right. We're on the whole thing. We're on the whole, whole thing. thing. Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I guess you'd have to clarify what the whole thing is. Are we talking about that one sentence right at the yeah. top? Yeah, the, whole the thing? top sentence is We're the... We're talking about number one, sorry, yep. number one. The number one on our little memo here, which is summarized again in that first sentence. Well, let me clarify. We've already approved one of them and not approved one of them. So number two, unless we want to, I mean, we can leave it in the minutes, I suppose, but that's right. gone. Yeah. So yeah. what we're really approving is the whole thing, because we're not going to then re-vote on approving. Correct. 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 Yep. Yep. We got it. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion? Good job. Mm -hmm. Any other exemptions? Last chance. Okay. <laughs> Here's the vote. Corey, I'm watching your face, and I just want to make sure <laughs> that you feel like you're anywhere near, because I, I get this is really confusing over here on the side, but do you feel like you've captured this in the notes? Because what's going to end up happening is this is all going to come back to us next meeting with confusing notes and amendments and... Thank God for the video. Well, this is what's going to, this is what, <laughs> this is what's going to council right here. There's no notes, there's nothing else beyond no that. No worries, I'm gonna go back and watch this portion of the video. I will make sure it's captured properly in the minutes and then you'll have a chance to review them. Thank you, Corey. Mm -hmm. I wanna make sure Jay's done typing before yeah. we actually do this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's changing. What? I'm still, oh, sorry, I'm still no, going. No, just give him a second. Give him a second. Yeah. Give him a second. Mm -hmm. How's that? Just need an A in front of approved. What? Right. Yeah. yeah, but th I didn't think that's what we voted for. I thought we did. You voted to allow it to sunset, not to remove it now. So th my suggestion is just to make it clear for council. So when they're reading the packet and they see what staff's recommendation is. But they've already made it, included and approved that motion. Yeah. yeah, that's a done thing, right? Yep. This is a different motion. Yeah. 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 Ryan, yeah. Undo I that. mean, it would be nice. I mean, you could also vote on the whole thing. Put my hat on. Yeah, um, this isn't, it, it's not. not I like the original, man. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> All right, fine. <laughs> or we could have another discussion on this. Yeah. I'd prefer not to. Till, till about 10 o'clock. So. Yeah. <laughs> That's a cool little tool, though. Mm -hmm. I kind of do. Oh, God, yeah. Three. I'm going to have to go back and chunk that whole thing out. We could remove an hour and a half from this meeting if we did that. Yep. <laughs> well, it's seven and a half years. Seven o'clock. <laughs> It'll erase your memory, too. <laughs> we'll tape erase this at the end. Great. There it is. Okay, yeah. we are voting on what is up there, and we're getting rid of two because it yep. doesn't exist anymore. Yep. One is already approved, we don't need to talk about that anymore. Yeah, we can we're take out the approved original, part. But that's not the point. Yep, that's not the point. <laughs> okay, um, all those in favor? Sorry, can I also, you're, we're also deleting this, right? For yeah. More? Correct. All those in favor? Yeah, um, I'm <laughs> the language, the Housing Advisory Board recommends that City Council adopt the Community Benefit Ordinance Attachment A, amending the land use code to establish a new community benefits program specific to permanently affordable housing. Really recommends changes, staff recommendation, supports the staff. Anything about exactly. height in there? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah. 
Do we feel like this is clear enough with what your question was that you put out to us? I mean, Mr. Attorney down there? Like I think so. I mean, because we're, we're specifying affordable housing, not the generic community benefits. We're being very specific on what our feelings are in Exhibit J. Um, you know, we've kind of gone through some of the other things, and I think this really highlights the parts that we're talking about. So and attachment A is specifically cited. Height. Right. That's the height thing. All right. So we did this. It's you, five, you five to two. Yeah, we, we, just making sure. It's five to two, right? Who's two? You were the two. No, I just paused okay. while you guys were jumping All right. to This it. is the vote now, Corey. Yeah. This is the vote. All those in favor? Six to one. Does anyone need a bathroom break? Yeah, let's take a five. Okay, <laughs> five minute break. So are we done with this whole thing, this part, community benefits now? Yes, until phase two. <laughs> you want me to do my phase two presentation now? No. no. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, Carl, I want to say yeah. really, really awesome job on this too. And with the the slides as well as the presentation, because, you know, taking a 42 page staff report and turn it to those slides. Yeah, that's nice. <laughs>
And on to something much less contentious, Alpine Balsam. <laughs> Um, do we have any staff update regarding that? I'm pretty sure everybody <laughs> left. <laughs> I wasn't there. <laughs> but I did read the article in the paper this morning. <laughs> we'll recap that for you, but no, I think some of you were there. Yeah, we were there. Make sure your thing's on. Yeah, All right, I'm gonna leave this well, to Jacques. He was, <laughs> he was definitely there, I was there, Adam was Yeah, there. I was there. Well, I do have a question because I went to look for minutes and of course they aren't posted until too late for our meeting and I wasn't there. Um, so what did can you give us a little, I mean, where did you guys, where did it land last night with I, what's going on? I can give you the one minute version, the yep. 49 minute version. Um, the, all, all that happened last night is um, we had a presentation from staff. We um, heard public comment, uh, council and planning board got to ask questions of staff. Uh, council left, planning board deliberated for uh, like 50 minutes, something like that, and um, approved the uh, staff's recommendation, basically. Um, there were a few pieces of nuanced discussion in there, um, mostly relating to um, some questions of, uh, you know, how use was spelled out, correlations between a couple pieces of the plan and uh, text of a document. Um, and the bar and the height. Yeah, and there was a discussion between, I think there were some people who who are, I guess maybe just newer to the conversation, who were confused about talking about both floors and feet in terms of height, but that's common in all sections of the code right now. So if you're familiar with the zoning code, it says, you know, you can have two stories or 35 feet or three stories or 42 feet or whatever. It's just kind of like how we, it's, it's in there everywhere. Um, so it's, it's actually not uh, nothing new. Um, what else am I missing? You guys are both there, so. Yeah, we were. Yeah, um, I feel like that was about it. That was about it. Yeah. And I guess we did, we did um, as per the uh, headline on the front page today, uh, criticize city council for um, not following through on the scope that they allocated in the staff work plan and for the project and changing the scope. Yep. So now, that, that's the key part. That's one of my questions was that remains this reduced scope that we're just looking at. Yeah, we, and the decision is really like a, it's a two body decision. So planning boards and approval body and city council's approval body. So we have to really approve the same thing. And so it's really easy for us to get in a situation where we'd say, um, I mean, the one possibility we talked about was like, well, let's just approve the area plan that was the whole area that we saw last time. Um, and, you know, while I sympathize with that approach and the kind of message it sends, it's pretty aggressive. And I know that it would just bounce back to us. So, you know, I was kind of, you know, arguing for like, well, let's just uh, have a, I mean, we can make a statement about that and then talk about the thing on the table. So that's what we actually did at the end. So the thing on the table is just the air, just the site plan. Mm -hmm. okay. it's, it's just yep. the uh, pro uh, city owned properties. The city owned properties, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Which are pretty okay. much in alignment okay. with the um, area plan that city council and planning board reviewed before that. Yep. And a bunch of the comments that we made on that area plan get it, did get adopted in the city parcels. So I think staff did, a, I think, a really good job of simulating or uh, synthesizing feedback from city council and planning board and the public and all these different directions. Uh, but then just reduce the scope to the city parcel. So right. Okay. I just wanted to, yeah, I wanted to make sure that there wasn't any significant shift in that before I said something about just the city parcels and it didn't apply anymore. Yep. Is, is this discussion a little late to the party? Because it seems like the discussion between the people who have decided have, has already happened. Uh, so planning, <laughs> uh, that was an interesting part of the <laughs> process. We didn't actually, uh, oh. planning board and city council didn't have a dialogue directly between the two of us. Um, they just ask council or staff questions and then left. So city council hasn't voted on it yet. Um, sure. Planning board has. So uh, one way this could go is if you guys have some insights, if has have, have has some insights that influence city council's thinking on it, then city council modifies what's, um, or if they do, you know, they can modify what's in front of them on that uh, city owned parcel and the. And then it comes back to planning board. This thing. Yeah, then it would have to come back to planning board. And if we didn't approve it, then it would go back to city council. And if they didn't approve it, then it would come back to city planning board. So there's kind of a potential for that. So what I kind of did with our board is I just said, look, you know, 
we're all smart folks, we're insightful, we could come up with a thousand things we wanna say about this, um, but let's make this more about like, on balance, can we live with it? Does it well enough re reflect community input, staff's intelligence, council direction, our thinking, your thinking? And everybody was like, yeah, pretty much it's good. And so it, it actually went pretty fast for us. And it was unanimous in 52 minutes. Yep, yeah. Right, so I like staff's position. In, in shorter than 52 minutes. <laughs> Um, or planning board's position, which is also staff's position, sorry. Yeah, I would I would make a motion that we, as housing advisory boards, support staff's latest plan for the city-owned parcels which at Alpine Ball. Planning board? Which was approved by planning. Second, second that motion. <laughs> Discussion. Um, I, I, I think, you know, we've worked through this quite a bit and, and the way that it's, uh, Kind of developed over time. I think it's something you know. Again, looking at it from the pragmatic standpoint, uh, I'd support it. Um, first of all, I hope we confine our discussion of it, if we possibly can, just to the housing aspect. I don't feel that it's in my understanding of the office and the city and the county and all that, we're the housing board, and if we talk about anything, it just should be the housing component. And the only concern I have about the plan is we're the housing board, we really care about permanently affordable housing, and I just don't see enough in there that actually gives me um, a good feeling that there's any assurance of as much permanently affordable housing as possible. And so that's that's just something I'd like the next, if I were to make any recommendation that I could, it would just be that the next city council look at that site um, and look at um, as many different options as possible for getting the most affordable, permanently affordable housing for as diverse a group of people as possible for that site. Jack. Yeah, at this point, I also, for the most part, agree. And I do just want to state that I want the current plan, the number of units that is specified in the current plan to try to maximize the number of permanently affordable units within that number of units. That's all I'll say. I don't even know where to start except uh, it was, I watched some of the comments last night that were quite contentious. Um, and I really came away thinking, we're not that far apart. The group Think Boulder and the, the people that came out and, and spoke uh, sort of against the, the findings of Think Boulder are actually pretty close. It's just one slightly leading to one side and one slightly leading to the other. I think everybody wants permanently affordable housing at that site. It's just a matter of height and density um, differences that people care about. And I, I sort of, I'm gonna abstain for now. I wanna hear what other people have to say about it because I, I, uh, I like the fact that it's, I, I think the city was very, or the staff was very thoughtful in how they approached and they tried to get feedback from as many uh, citizens as possible. But I, I think that that's a better site for housing. Um, than other services at this point. I made the motion, so I, I don't have much to say. Cool. <laughs> Mason, anything? Yeah, I think the only comment I would make is that I was disappointed in the dropping of the area plan as well. Um, uh, I'm frustrated by the fact that um, we continue to listen to a small majority versus the majority in our community. And, um, I, you know, I stand by what uh, ultimately the conclusion was with the planning board last night and can move forward on that motion as well. Yep. Um, just overall, I kind of echo Mason's sentiment about dropping the area plan. And at the same time, I also just want to say that Judy's point of you know, I don't know how to get it in there in a way other than trusting the process that's gonna take place, but that we do wanna see as much affordable housing in those units as we possibly can achieve, and a diversity of affordable housing as well. Any other discussion? I'll just wanna chime in for you. Uh, in, in the 
the actual plan, it does say that the primary goal is to address critical affordable housing needs. Just that's that's in there. But the plan itself, I mean, I, you know, I have looked into this some and and watched, you know, you guys last night and have been either attending or watching all the meetings. And there's very little talk in the plan itself of identifying affordable housing and people from the community did come up with plans that have more affordable housing than any of the options provided. And there's there's really no discussion about specifying how much affordable housing there will be. Obviously there will be either, you know, the inclusionary housing or or the cash in lieu or whatever it is. But I, I think that's a site where we should get way more out of that. And uh, and, and I agree with what you said, Juliet. I think all sides of this issue want permanently affordable housing of mixed, mixed uses on that site from mixed populations. And I just don't think the plan addresses that enough right now. Any other discussion? All right, those in favor? Those against? Five to two. No, I voted with. Oh, did you? Um, I'd also like to add, um, when you write that recommendation, um, could you please mention that the people who were against it felt that it was because there wasn't enough consideration of um, permanently affordable housing? Was that true for Juliet as well, or was that just I you? thought so, because okay. that's what you'd said. So that's... Another vote we'll have to take, probably. Let's say, say again. Mm, we. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we, long as you can yeah. convey that. Yeah. One nice pa one practice that we do is when people have uh, have a dissenting vote, we try to give them a chance to record what their rationale was, and it's just a document that goes into the minutes, like just like you did. And sure. A successful way of doing it. Gotcha. Okay. Um. Matters from the board, hopefully we can make this one pretty quick. The engagement committee, so we provided a draft uh, report of the August listening session and we were hoping to have a vote to adopt it. So I'm gonna put the motion forward. I move that we adopt uh, the draft of the August listening session report. Second. Discussion. We didn't get any comments from it, so I'm assuming that everyone was pretty okay with it. Perfect. And thank you all for taking part in that again. That was a good one. So um, we, le we learned a lot of lessons. Find <laughs> <laughs> good. Yeah, <laughs> good in learning experience. Okay, um, all those in favor? Unanimous. Unfinished business, annual letter to council. Um, so just for everyone's awareness, a lot of our, it's our October meeting, correct? I just want to verify, is gonna be based on this and what we want to say in it and what we want to do with it. So um, just be aware that that's a big topic coming next time. Is there any discussion around what we want to do with it right now? Judy? Um, I think to just wait to next time um, without doing some preparatory stuff would put us in a bad place timeline-wise for getting it done on time, realizing how long it took last time. And I'd, I'd like to bring up just a couple things. Last time we sent the copy of our, it wasn't called a listening session then, but the session we had where we got comments from the public to council, and that proved to be a disaster because it was stream, extremely long. It included all the data from Be Heard Boulder and all that stuff. Um, with the two reports from the listening sessions, I think that's really good information for the brand new council. We can either attach that to our letter because they're much shorter, or we could send them in right after the new city council is picked. And so I'd like to just discuss that for a minute. I'd also like to see if we can get two people right now to agree to work together on a draft of the letter and have each of us send our ideas of what we want included to them. So those are the two things I'd Work on it before the next meeting, is that your Work ask? On it before the next meeting, send a draft to us so we can start, yeah, send a draft to us before the next meeting. Otherwise, 
otherwise um, I'm really worried that we won't be done in time. So let's, yeah, Mason. Again, I would just really caution the fact that we got chastised for 30 minutes about our lengthiness and desire to want to do anything other than a brief two paragraph um, statement on our issues. So I get the desire to want to influence council, but I think brevity is our friend. How do you feel about the idea of sending it to the new council? I don't know. I just, I, I feel like we can make something succinct and to the point and it doesn't need to be five pages. Okay. Anyone else want to weigh in on that? The uh, Attaching the listening session reports either to the letter or okay. sending them separately to the new yeah, council. What we could do is at the bottom of our letter ask them if they want it, you know, if they want to see the stuff, we could send a hyperlink or something, you know. I like that. Give them the opportunity to. It's in our drive. I mean, just hyperlink it if they're interested. That way it's not just all there. Right. Okay. Yeah. So uh, as far as um, the length, um, it's easy for any of us to look up all the letters that were sent last year and to look up planning board's letters over the past few years. And um, I think part of uh, what hurt our report was how long that, that section was about that session we had. Um, but. Um, and also we talked about something they didn't want to hear about. But first of all, it's a br going to be six of the nine people are going to be, I mean, it's going to be a new council. Um, and this is the time when it's really important that where they set their work plan for the next two years. So this year's going to be very different than it was last year because last year they already had our work plan and they didn't want us to vary from it very much. But this year they don't have their work plan done and I think it's one of the most important things we can do is to talk about what we want. And when I look at other, like the planning board, all the other letters, true, we don't have to be five pages long with an attachment of like 20 pages, but we can be two or three good pages and that's, that's not unusual for what the other boards do and I think we need to put some thought into what we would like them to work about to work on as far as housing goes. Um, so I, and I think we should start now. So I'd, I'd like to see if there's two people who's who are willing to work on a draft and solicit input from people. Anyone interested in that? I'd rather it not be me, but I will if no one else wants to. But I'd rather other people. Do it. I mean, I liked working with you. You too. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm thinking right at this current juncture, it's just probably not even possible for anyone to take that on. So we're going to have to come ready and prepared with what you want next time uh, to go in the letter, so we can make that decision. What I think might be a good idea is if we set a, a date for all of us, um, you know, knowing everybody's schedule sure um, maybe say October 15th or October 10th or something like that where we give a list of you know like our five top issues or something like that sure it would how about we have it ready for the packet or why don't we have it ready for your guys's meeting and you guys can condense you know put it together like we did last year is everybody submit it before your meeting sure put them into a list that way everybody can review them one of the things that we did last year was um, if you had an idea, you would send that out just to the board as these are the ideas that I have and this is the position behind it. And then that way everybody could just sit with it before we got to the yeah, meeting. So that's what I'm saying. I think that's great. Yeah. And that date would be October 14th. October 14th. So then what we're saying is by October 14th, if anybody does have ideas on topics they would like to do to make sure that it goes to Corey goes to Corey by then and we'll condense them down. And again, it's the topic you want to discuss and your reasoning or positioning behind why our board should focus on it for the next year. Great. Is that good? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Any new business um, from anybody else before we go on to matters from staff? Okay. Uh, matters from staff. Uh, the only thing I have is um, I sent out the email about the application questions for new HAB members. Um, so this is your kind of your last chance if there are changes that you would like to make. Could you repeat that? The letter 
um, that goes, accompanies the application for the uh, new members of HAB. So I know that in previous years you've spent a lot of time wordsmithing that. Um, so if there are some additional changes that we would like to make, now is the time. I just had one comment, which is that mm -hmm. mem there are some members that say that it takes 10 hours per week of time um, as an investment to be on this board, and I would say that, that might scare some people off from applying uh, because the, what's written on the website is you meet once a month and the meeting length is three hours, and to say that there's an additional 10 hours of work per week is like a, having a part-time job. Mm -hmm. And if you're talking about a volunteer citizenry that have, have jobs and families and whatever else they have to take care of, that just seems like a, a huge ask and it would be a deterrent for a lot of people. So I would um, take the 10 hours out. I don't spend 10 hours. I spend plenty of hours preparing for a meeting, but 10 hours a week I think is excessive. And can I, I'll just respond. I know this has been discussed quite, quite a bit. So the folks that have been around for a while um, might have a lot of lot to say about this, but um, also it was a very different environment last year. It had, was meeting twice a month at least, right? Yeah. So that's that's a fair question. Mason. Okay. Well, um, yeah. I was going to say <laughs> maybe we could change the language to not at least, but I don't know. I put in a lot of time into this, so um, sure. I am the chair, but I put in a lot of time in this before I was the chair too. I think what Adam and I were getting to when we were thinking about this and when we were asked to talk about it at uh, one of the board meetings last year was the fact that it's kind of, you know, similar to planning board and stuff is that to really give informed opinions, and I think we're seeing it with community benefit as well, is that if you're not already actively working in housing um, it, it, to onboard, I mean, we went through being waterboarded <laughs> last year is pretty much what I would call it. Um, and I was actually probably closer to 30 hours a week trying to um, go through literally everything so that you really fully understood what it was that you were trying to envelope um, for the, some of these in-depth in pieces that we were making recommendations on that I think we see just a glimpse of it today, but we ha we were dealing with a lot more. And I think onboarding um, from all the lists that we got, that took most of us a couple months to get through all of that stuff. So I, I get it where it feels like um, it might feel intense or like a part-time job, but what we're doing here is making recommendations for an entire community, and I personally take that incredibly serious. And I personally want somebody that is a comrade at arms that's willing to put the time and energy in um, and has the time and energy to be able, and I expect the same out of my council, I expect the same out of planning board, um, if you're gonna do these boards, that it's not just a phone in. Um, and I, I get you're prepared, I mean, I think, um, it, to know the history of why we're making some of these decisions and it's a commitment we make to our community. So I, I'm comfortable with the 10 hours a week. I think it's legitimate. Mason, <laughs> I'm going to tease you and say this is one of those times once again. <laughs> I completely agree. <laughs> Anyone else? I think just from my perspective, I don't know if 10 hours a week is the right number or not. You barely make it here on Time Shock, so. <laughs> you know why that is, don't you? <laughs> um, but it is a significant effort yeah. to try to understand a little bit of what's going on with planning, yeah. trying to understand some of the economics of it, trying to, all these parts, and it's a complex thing, and I think, so for me, maybe it's not 10 hours, but something that suggests that this is important. And time. I think you three guys in particular um, have a leg up because of the industries that you're in. So you already come with a certain amount of understanding of this. And maybe that's where the hours flex to is given a person's background. Like, you know, my friend Claudia does a lot of studying and writing around housing. So if it's something that it, it's already in your purview, you probably wouldn't be spending a lot. But for me, it was, I didn't know Robert's rules. I didn't know any of it. So it, it was a lot, it was a lot to onboard all the way around process. How did we do this? And 
So yeah, I agree. Well, onboarding is different than long term. So I would say, I would agree, I, I spent tons of time mm -hmm. in the onboarding phase, but then long term, if you have a five year commitment mm -hmm. like I do. That's a good point. I think that, you yeah. know, I yep, think that's you have to point. sort of prepare people for onboarding versus what your long term commitment is. That's a great point. So maybe that's a shift in the language is to say something like when you're new board members, you can expect in the first six months something like this while you're onboarding and that it would taper off mm -hmm. a little bit. I, I Depending on the pr the recommendations, just say up to yeah. I, of it, I certainly um, empathize with your feelings, Juliet, and I'm sort of caught in the middle because on one hand we don't want to miss good people who are really busy. On the other hand, it we what Mason said, we really are making decisions that might impact a lot of people, and we really do have to put time, not just show up at the meeting. So so. I, you know, I, I don't want to catch people off guard and have somebody get on the board and go, I had no idea it would take this much commitment. And, and so that's why I like it being in there. I just don't want to catch people off guard. I want to chime in just a tiny bit, not so much on that, but more, we, planning board has had a similar conversation just recently, uh, we're just kicking it off. Um, and what we're trying to add, and we don't have probably the same, I've never read this, so I don't know what it says. Um, we don't have exactly the same parallel, but one thing that we're gonna to try to add into our application is an expectation of attendance. Because this year we've had some folks who like came in with, uh, um, you know, missing a lot of meetings. So we were sort of like, oh, we really gotta talk about that. Yeah, we already have a we piece. Have three in our charter. You, okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah it's three, three successive. Three successive, uh, and then we can vote to remove you from the board if you're not participating. Three successive. Yeah. yeah. What, what if we change that sentence to say, uh, Appointment to the board is a significant commitment, and new board members may expect to spend as much as 10 hours per week on board activity. For an onboarding process? Yeah. Or, well, onboarding. Something like that, right. That's good. For the first six months to a year, and then tapers from there or something. Yeah, or even say, because they might not know what onboarding is, so just say for the first six months to a year. Mm -hmm. I think that's just a fair representation. A bit, I think is, because agree you know you don't want right. good people to not one step up um, I mean the reason why that is I think anybody who's paid any attention to it knows so do we want to leave it at up to or do we want to leave, leave it at at least <laughs> <laughs> I like that <laughs> I like that I love it <laughs> a roundabout <laughs> okay Count the time thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> board members report spending approximately <laughs> 10 hours per board activity. Okay, is did you want to mention something specifically about the onboarding or just the initial yes, time the commitment? Initially, you ongoing. could even put initially or initially spending at least 10 hours a week and. No. How about if we said it and said spending approximately 10 hours per week on board activity um, at least initial, at least for the initial six months to year, something like that, would that work for people? There's a significant commitment and board members, members report spending approximately yeah. 10 Members may expect, that's what I was saying, right. To spend 10 hours per week. Yeah. Up to 10 hours, up to 10 hours. Up to 10 hours per week. This kind of yeah. softens yeah. it down a little bit. Great. It's not like it's always that, mm -hmm. but you might expect that that could happen right. to you. Perfect. So, um, sorry, can you say that again? Say it again. Um, New members so may expect. Do you want me to read what I have, guys? Yeah. Okay. What? He, he well, we're watching. Me. May expect. Sorry, I know I've been trying. I think we're both typing, but what I wrote is board suggested uh, language to reflect appointment to board is significant commitment, and new members may expect to spend up to ten hours per week in the first six to ten months. <laughs> In the first, what did you say? Year? Six to 10 months. Six to 10 months? Six to 12 months. The only thing I'd say there's 10 hours per week on board activity for the first six to 12 months. It's so just keep that on board activity and then just say for the first six to 12 months. Makes cool. Sense to spend. Yeah. And honestly, I mean, and I know where you're coming from on this, but I. I would r rather people come in and be slightly surprised and back off from it than 
thinking that they're gonna be able, to, like, I don't think this is like other board appointments where sometimes you can just show up and you have your agenda and um, you don't really have to do a lot of background or, you know, we've all been on the fluffer stuff and this is a little deeper than that. So I'd rather have somebody be slightly surprised than um, really worried or complaining that it's too many hours. Great. Juliet, does that? Okay, I don't think we need to do an official vote here since we're all, all good no. with this, it looks like. Um, great. Jay, do you have everything you need? No, unless you have any other questions for me. I have nothing else. De okay. Are we going to debrief? Yeah, we're going to debrief. I didn't see it on here. Yep. There, flip it over. It's on the back Oh, it's on the back side. <laughs> Didn't even know we had a page two. Do you have something you'd like to say? Yeah, I was, I'm really curious if there's a way we can, t bless you, tighten up our discussion times. Like, I'm curious if, if every board goes through this and if there are points that we could take from other boards or something. I don't know what it is, but it just seems like what happens where I think things get missed too or some kind of rubs happen for people is when we start doing that moment where you said you would look back at the tape, everybody starts going, uh-huh, yep, mm -hmm, yep, that's good, yep, uh-huh, and we're all on different pages and I'm like, no, he just said this and you just said that and that's not anywhere near it. So I think there has to be a way of just kind of pausing or slowing it down a little bit, making sure that we're repeating back the sentences, but not like, over beating the horse or something. Because like, yeah. I think we get, we rabbit hole and everybody feels like they have to reiterate their point over and over and over again. And I think we just, one round, say your point, maybe vote, I don't know. I don't know, something. It's just the thing that, I mean, we're definitely much better than that first recommendation with ADU. Sure. I mean, that was a brutal process, but we had nothing in for framework in, in place. I feel like I'm still giving too much leeway to be honest with you. Yep. Mm. To me, to, to tighten it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's I think sometimes maybe what might help on that note, I totally agree with you, uh -huh. is maybe, I don't know if it's staff or whomever, can give us some bullet points to focus on yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, versus us just trying to come up with it. So I thought the two questions were That's good. why we went to the two questions. I know, but those were, you know. Yeah. And where we got trapped a little bit is that we, when we did the, the nursing home piece of it is that we r decided to redo our whole own thing and then we came back to what it was anyway, yep. so, right. and, you know. Yeah, we go around in circles a little bit. Yeah. The um, key issue thing works really well. Yeah. A while back when Planning Board was struggling with us, we started having staff do key issues for yep. us. Yep, yep. Um, and they're not really posed as questions so much, but like, each one is a subject for conversation that you can talk about discreetly. So like the problem that you guys faced tonight, we faced as well with the two questions is that one referred to Appendix J and the other one was about Appendix J, so you <laughs> yeah, had a yeah. completely screwed up conversation. So that's not a problem with your discussion, that's just a problem with the uh, crafting of key issues. Sorry, Jay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was all Carl, Carl man. <laughs> that guy. <laughs> that guy, um, can't take him anywhere. <laughs> so if, if staff can feed you essentially key issues and then you can, it helps, helps a lot in terms yep. of structuring your thinking before you get yep. to the meeting. Because yep, yep. you're thinking, oh, we're gonna talk about for us it's like parking and then we're gonna talk about open space and then we're gonna talk about mm -hmm. it. So it's really easy for us to understand it. Yep. And then, yeah, Adam, it's cool for you to like, I mean, have a strong hand in making sure people don't over talk. Yep. Um, and just my Every observations, piece. there's a tons of over talking. There's sometimes inter interruptions. Um, there's definitely a lot of repetition. Um, there's like a totally bozo planning board guy who just talked all the time. <laughs> That's the thing that I noticed the most. <laughs> The first part, yeah. Okay. So Anybody, um, yeah, Terry. Off topic, we spent a lot of time today talking about height, right? That was the gist of the meeting in, in a lot of ways, that fourth and fifth floor. And I just, it sounds crazy coming from me, right? For coming from a real estate guy, that I would just caution everybody's perceived benefit in these fourth and fifth floors of these buildings. And there's only five or six of them that have been built, but but they've changed the landscape of the town. They've changed the feel of the town. I walk around all the time and it's very, very different. And I know that there's this perception of, oh, if we have a fourth or fifth floor, we add another unit or we get another this, or we, you know, the building can't be built without it. Uh, so I don't know about that. <laughs> but, um, but just be cautious of this perception that there's this huge benefit to it. And we're gonna get more money to build this or we're gonna do more of that. Cause it just really, in my opinion, impacts the town. And I don't know if in a good way. 
I, I uh, also want to add in the debriefing, that's a point really well taken. And, and also, I, I feel that the discussion on community benefit was a million times better than our discussion on ADU. And this, that this is the first time we've had to discuss a tough subject since then to make specific recommendations on. And I actually feel, you know, and I didn't even get my way all the time, and I feel it went really well. So. Cool. I'm going to make a comment just about uh, the document that was sent out, the 42-page document. I would love to see an executive summary. I felt like the presentation that Carl did was more along the lines of an executive summary. And as a layperson, um, trying to digest 42 pages uh, of, of t very technical language and make an informed decision was difficult. And to, to be more to provide a summary and to say, here's exactly what we need your feedback on. Maybe it's key issues, Brian, or maybe it's something else, but I'd like to see a little bit more succinct crystallization because it feels like a lot of wonky te technical language that I know is, you know, that's what you, you do when in planning and, that, and that's the kind of language that's used. I have my own technical language that I use in my work, but um, that would be helpful. Like maybe just to, to be more succinct. Right, like a yeah. link to the PowerPoint. Right, so you can look through the PowerPoint ahead of time, so you, you know, and then you can kind of look at it, right? They're not done in time for that. Yeah. I was just gonna But even if it's that day, I'm saying, you know, you know, whenever it's done, I know how it is, believe me. So, but it could help. All right, well, thank you all. We, we did it. Good work. Good work. Adjourned. Yes. Adam, I don't envy you, buddy. Running for council, doing this, working, that is a lot. Well, that's the thing I chose to use. No, no, it's good. Live from Paris, on France 24.